Helpful human. Feels good, man. Yeah, man. It's going to be a great stream today. Listen, I'm ready for this. I think we're going to have a lot of fun. Is it E time? You absolutely know it's E time. So let's begin. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome on this wonderful June 21st, 2018. It's a Thursday here in rainy Indiana, and we're going to be going over the what's often referred to as the Dinosaur Book of Operating Systems, Operating System Concepts. I think we're going to have a lot of fun today. I've never been through this book. I used a different Operating Systems book when I took an Operating Systems class. So I think that we'll learn a lot together today. What did everyone think about the NPR intro? That was pretty fun. Listen, I have some people making custom intros for me. I'm not just going to steal the NPR Morning Edition theme forever. I'm only going to steal it for a little bit. But hey, we're going to have a lot of fun today. I'm streaming the same time as Destiny. Maybe Destiny's streaming the same time as I am. Okay. So as many of you may know, as some of you may not, my name is Engineering Today. I'm a PhD student in computer engineering, and I'm here to bring my knowledge to the world. Just to let you know, my content will never be behind any paywalls. It will always be free. If you like the stream, give it a follow. Any donations or subscriptions that you may give to the channel, that'll only go to making the stream better. However, the focus of the stream is of course not on donations, it's on you guys learning something new. So without further ado, let's get started. The Dinosaur Book on Operating Systems. A favorite, to be sure. So, what we're going to start off in with this book is we want to focus on, in the beginning, of what is an operating system. It's very important that we get that straightened out right from the start to give us a little bit of context into what we're going to be learning here. So we're going to cover traditional and server operating systems, as well as maybe a little bit into mobile devices. If we go down a little bit further, let's see what the breakdown is for chapter one. So the first thing we want to do is we want to understand what an operating system does. Then we want to know a little bit about our computer system and about our operating system and how these two things differ. Then we want to you know, get a brief introduction to some of the common things that an operating system does. So something like process management, something like memory management, storage management, and we also want to know how does our operating system work to protect us? What are some of the kernel data structures, computing environments, and then a little bit of background on what are some open source operating systems? Now, as you may know, I am actually streaming this on Linux. 
an, op an open source operating system. I use Ubuntu. Then we'll have a quick summary and we'll skip over the exercises. Okay, so let's begin. Let's get to that page number one. All right, look at this. We have such a regal dinosaur over here. So regal. He's ready to get started. We're ready to get started. Let me go ahead and pull up my other tab. Make sure I can see chat. Make sure I can see the dashboard. Hedgeman, Swell Whale. Listen, thanks you guys for following. Let's get started. Got a whole bunch of yees in chat, and I appreciate you all being here. I appreciate you all. So let's get started. So an operating system, let's zoom in a little bit so that we can actually see the text. So an operating system is a program that manages the computer's hardware. So this is kind of our abstraction between what the user sees, so the user doesn't have to see the actual hardware. It also provides the basis for application programs. So when we write an application, we don't want to have to write every application catering it to hardware. It's convenient for us to have this middle layer between it. Okay. An amazing aspect of operating systems is how they vary in accomplishing these tasks. So we have, today we have uh, Mac OS, which I think might be, is it OS X? Is that what they decided on is the last operating system? And then they're just going to continuously update it? I think it's OS X. Then there's Windows 10. I believe Windows 10 was, is also technically the last operating system. They're still going to push out patches, but you know it's a different implementation. Definitely very different than something like Mac OS. And then there's all the Linux distributions. So like Ubuntu that we're on right now. There's also mainframe operating systems. Of course we just talked about PC operating systems. But then there's also mobile operating systems. So something like iOS or Android. You know, These are some other examples of operating systems. So thus, an operating system is designed to be convenient, and then some, or rather, some operating systems are designed to be convenient or easy to use, while others, typically mobile operating systems, they're designed to be efficient. So sometimes we want, when we don't care about, say, power, you know, we may do some things that, you know, you know, they take a lot of power when they're running, because we have plenty of power to spare. However, if we're in a mobile application, we want to make sure that our operating system isn't absolutely killing our battery life. So in other cases, we'll sacrifice performance in the sake of efficiency. So before we explore the details of computer system operation, we need to know something about the computer system structure. So we'll talk about the basic functions of system startup, of our input output, and of storage. We'll also take a look at something that we've seen before, at least in some of our other lectures, which is some basic computer architecture. So if we're going to build an intermediary between applications and between hardware, we have to know a little bit about the architecture that we're working on. So because an operating system is large and complex, I forgot what the stat is or how many millions of lines of code that Windows is, but you know, if you think of it as even just a million lines of code, that's an incredibly large project. It must be created piece by piece. So we'll we'll see this theme of fragmentation in operating systems where we want to make them kind of like Lego pieces. We want them to, you know, kind of plug and play with one another. And if we look at the Linux kernel, this is a great at least 50 million? Yeah, that sounds a lot, that, that, sounds, that sounds reasonable to me. So as we'll see in the Linux operating system, we'll see that the schedulers in the Linux operating system, you know, they're actually just, you know, a couple different files within a folder. We have a file called fair.c, we have a file called rt.c, which stands for real time, 
and so we can add our own scheduler if we wanted to have say a custom process scheduler so you know there's a lot of hooks into the operating system where we can make modifications so each of these pieces should be a well delineated portion of the system with carefully defined inputs and outputs so we don't want to have a lot of ambiguity here with how to interface so what else will we cover additionally additionally we cover several other topics to help set the stage for the remainder of this text so this is going to be things like data structures computing environments as well as you know what's what's the landscape today so here we have you know our most basic abstract view of components of a computing system so of course at the bottom we have our physical hardware this is you know the actual processor itself and all the hardware associated with making the processor work now on top of the computer hardware we need something to tell the hardware what to do and so this is typically the operating system now if we're going to have something that tells the hardware what to do that's a convenient abstraction for us to start building things like application programs and system programs so in this layer we can have things like compilers like GCC we can have assemblers we can have text editors so something like gedit or notepad we can have you know any arbitrary application or something such as a database system then interfacing with all these applications we can have multiple users that communicate over some IO with these application programs so let's start off with the central question of what do operating systems do and what is their role in the overall computer system so a computer system can be divided into roughly four components like we saw in figure one hardware the OS apps and users so hardware is of course things like the CPU memory and then the physical you know IO devices and ports you know these are going to be the basic computing resources then there's things like application programs such as Word or Excel compilers things like Chrome you know these are all you know it, these fall into this region of system and application programs so the operating system controls the hardware and coordinates its use among various applications so you know if we consider this to be a single CPU down here we need some way to manage so that say the text editor isn't hogging all of the time of the computer hardware maybe we need to find some way of scheduling all of these applications all of these processes so that everything's fair and balanced and everybody gets their fair share of the processing resources and so that's generally called the process scheduler so we can also view a computer system as consisting of hardware software and data pretty intuitive the operating system provides the means for proper use of these resources in the operation of a computer system so an OS is similar to a government like a government it performs no useful function by itself it simply provides an environment within the within which other programs can do useful work so we get, they're basically trying to impress upon you the idea that an operating system more or less is just a framework so what do we see from the user side so the user view so the user view of the computer varies according to the interface so most computer users typically sit in front of a monitor keyboard mouse and maybe the physical PC itself so such a system is designed for a single user to monopolize the resources generally if we have you know our own PC in our house you know that PC is designed so that if I'm sitting at it working somebody else isn't coming in from some other connection to a network and taking my resources so its goal is to maximize the work or play that the user is performing 
However, we also want to note that because this is generally for the gen or this is for the general public, a key point is ease of use with some attention paid to performance. So we want it to perform well, but most of all, we want it to be easy to use. And here, we really don't care about resource utilization. This is something that's, you know, far off in the back of our minds. And so when we're talking about resource utilization, this means that, you know, we don't care if we're not using 100% of the processor at all given times. All that matters is that it's easy to use and that we and that it's fast enough when we need it to be fast but not that we're using all of our resources so in other cases so say a terminal connected to a mainframe or a micro or a mini computer so this is when we're talking about you know more distributed server type environments or a server with many users connected to it we have other users accessing the same computer through other terminals so Everyone's sharing resources. They may be exchanging information. They may not be. You know, if we think about something like the Amazon Cloud or Amazon uh, EC2, which is their elastic compute cloud. So if we think about something like that, you know, we don't want users to share resources. So in that case, we want to split the resources, but we want those resources to be fairly isolated. The operating system in such cases is designed to maximize utilization. So if we are splitting our resources, say, four ways, we want to make sure that you know everybody is using all of their available resources. That way, you know, everyone even even though that they have say a decreased number of cores or a decreased, you know, a decreased access to, you know, the shared caches. We want to make sure that they're able to, they're, they're using all of the resources that they have remaining at any given time. Because, you know, end of the day, you know, the user doesn't want to have to, say, get 10 VMs to do something that they could do on maybe 8 VMs or 6 VMs. So if they're using the resources effectively, then that means they can pack more into the same space. Still, in other cases, users sit at workstations connected to networks of other workstations and servers. These users have dedicated resources at their disposal, but they also share resources such as networking and servers, uh, including file, compute, and print servers. So therefore, their operating system is designed to be a compromise between individual usability and resource utilization. So if we're having, you know, physical access to these shared resources, of course, our, one of our primary concerns has to be the person sitting in front of the computer has to be able to use it effectively, so usability. But because it's still these shared resources, we still care about something like resource utilization. Okay. So recently, when we're talking about mobile computers, we get a fundamentally different problem. When we're talking about mobile computers, we really care about efficiency. And so this is generally in terms of power. So quite often, mobile computers are connected to networks through cellular or wireless technologies. So, you know, we can kind of see, like I know that, I know Apple caught a lot of flack for their iPad commercial where they had some kid laying down in her backyard and she's on an iPad and some neighbor looks over the fence and says, oh, what kind of computer is that? And she goes, what's a computer? Now, some people made fun of it, but there's some validity, validity to it. So many people nowadays, you know, they don't need a PC at their home. They may not even need a laptop at their home. You know, say if you work in the service industry, and maybe your cons your consumption of media is limited to, you know, maybe you're mainly on social media. You do Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Maybe you watch some videos on YouTube. You know, you don't actually need a PC. So we see this huge jump in mobile computing as being, you know, the primary uh, compute resources for a lot of families nowadays. No, <laughs> no. What do you not like the trend or? 
Do you disagree with the trend? <laughs> you need a PC for heating? Listen, I've gotten through plenty of winters with having the PC basically heat my room for me. I don't have a PC anymore. I just have a laptop, but... He was talking about the commercial? Yeah. A lot of people didn't like that commercial. I thought the commercial was fine. You know? I get what they were trying to say. Okay. Maybe one day we'll be a big old Twitch streamer and we'll get a streaming PC of our own so I don't have to wait until everybody's out of my lab and then use my lab computer. But hey, I like to teach. I'm happy we're here. Okay, so let's continue on. So the user interface for mobile computers is generally a touch screen, of course. Uh-huh, so this is just talking about the ease of use thing. So now instead of our typical I.O. devices, we're using different kinds of I.O. like touch screens. So some computers have little or no user view. So this is a different kind of computing. For example, embedded computers. So this is when we have you know, a computer that does a very specific job. So it may control something like the cruise control in your car, or it may control all of the electrical components in your car. You know, we don't see these computers, and you know, the usability is not a big concern for us because technically the user, you know, the the companies themselves they don't want the user to have, you know, control or access to these computers. They're supposed to be abstracted away. That maybe only the dealer that has the special hook in can actually use these onboard computers. So now that we've seen a user view of the PC or of computing resources, let's take a more systems view. So from the computer's point of view, the operating system is the program most intimately involved with the hardware. So in terms of hardware, you know, the operating system, it's just another program. It's just a program that is actually, it's actually interfacing with. In this context, we can view an operating system as a resource allocator. So it's going to tell the PC who gets what resources. So what are the resources that we're allocating? So things like CPU time, and this will be done with something like a process scheduler. The memory space, so we want to make sure that we're isolating memory between different processes, that way we're not potentially leaking out information. I was actually reading a paper today specifically about this in GPUs. File storage space, we want to make sure that no nobody can, you know, say fill up the entire hard drive by themselves and take away this resource from everybody. We want to make sure that I.O. can be allocated effectively so that, you know, if somebody plugs in their computer or or rather they plug in their keyboard we want to make sure that you know it can work and there's many other things that we can talk about they get split so the operating system acts as the manager of these resources like we said so we can go ahead and skip a little bit of this a slightly different view of the operating system emphasizes the need to control various IO devices so not only are we controlling our own resources, but sometimes we control other resources that get plugged in. My face when I was outraged, but I eventually actually inducted. Now I feel like a reactionary skeptic. Yikes. I should never get angry before I research. <laughs> Kappa. Listen, I mean, if somebody doesn't know what a computer is and they have an iPad, I mean... Listen, it was a silly commercial because everyone still calls everything a computer. I mean, it's it's why people still say turn down the volume on the TV or switch the channel or turn the channel. It's be, you know, or why the save icon is usually a floppy disk, you know. That's not what we use anymore. It's still the colloquial term, but you know, I get what they were trying to do. Apple wants to be hip and they want to be cool, so they have to go, oh, we're not a computer anymore. Don't call us a computer. But, you know, it's just a commercial at the end of the day. Okay, a control program manages the execution of user programs to prevent errors. 
and improper use of the computer. So we need some kind of intermediate state. We need some kind of intermediate state so that some application doesn't come in and do extraordinarily serious damage to our computer. We want to make sure that there's some control there or some backup there where one program can't do something extremely malicious without being detected or stopped. And so usually this is with I.O. devices. So now let's actually get into what is an operating system. So how would we define an operating system? Okay. So by now you can probably see the term operating system covers many roles. So we can really, this operating system is this, it's the great mediator. It, it really, you know, it places balancing acts. So on the one hand, it has to be talking with the hardware and managing resources. But then on the other hand, it has to be talking with the applications and kind of writing what they want to do to the actual hardware. So it has kind of this pressure from above and below. So computers are present within toasters, cars, ships, spacecraft, homes, and businesses. You know, especially with things like IoT, the Internet of Things, com computers with some kinds of software on it for managing the hardware, they're everywhere nowadays. Let's see. So early computers evolved into great general purpose multifunction mainframes. So that's a key thing to understand that when we're talking about an operating system and why we need it to why we need a good operating system or one that's designed well it's because it's supposed to do arbitrary functions it's really supposed to handle anything that we give it so in the 60s gordon moore founder of one of the founders of intel he of course predicted that the number of transistors on an integrated circuit would double every 18 months so it's usually 18 months to two years and it's held true until fairly recently and so this is what has caused you know most of our performance improvement on CPUs now with that performance improvement on CPUs this gives us a lot of leeway for making our software better because now our software that last generation ran at you know some normal pace now after the next transistor technology, it's running twice as fast. So we, we have two options there. We can either just leave it alone and it runs twice as fast, or we can add twice as many features to it. And so I'll let you guys guess which one typically happens. If you guys want to guess, I'll, 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 give you, I'll give you just a couple seconds if you want to guess which one whether or not it's they leave it alone and it goes twice as fast or they add twice as many features so the answer is they always add twice as many features twice as many it's never leave it alone and it runs twice as fast they always add more features if you ever wonder why i think the windows server core or a windows server like 2012 operating system is 35 gigs or something or some ridiculous size that's why they just add more features but that's not the only reason why Windows is so big Windows is so big also because they never get rid of anything it's constant legacy support okay so then how can we define what an operating system is? So in general, there's no completely adequate definition. So we have to kind of piece something together as we see fit. Operating systems exist because they offer a reasonable way to solve the problem of creating a computing system. So they're a means to an end. The fundamental goal of a computer system is to execute user programs and to make solving problems easier. So when we're talking about a computing system, it does two things. It executes programs, usually arbitrary programs, and it makes solving them easier than if we were to do it by hand or some other means. And so the hardware itself is constructed towards this goal. We'll see if you if you come to the architecture class that I do on Mondays, we'll see this is a very key trend. All the architectures we do aim to make it easier to program the computer 
at the same time though making everything run faster so it's this idea of programmability plus performance that we want since bare hardware alone is not particularly easy to use application programs are developed and so the operating system was hence developed so that you don't have to look at the hardware and that's something that we have talked about so let's see so we're going to talk about what a kernel is so a more common definition and one that we will usually follow is that the operating system is the one program running at all times on the computer and so generally we call this a kernel so if someone ever says they're a kernel developer generally they're talking about the Linux kernel and this is kind of the loose definition that we talk about so with the kernel there are two types of programs there are the system programs associated with the OS but not necessarily part of the kernel and then there's also application programs which include all programs not associated with the, op uh, the operation of the system heard that a lot yeah Oh, like kernel programmers? Does the part of the kernel that is responsible for booting need to be written in assembly? Um, yeah, because that's usually hard-coded into, uh, that, that's, that's, that's usually hard-coded, so it doesn't go through like a compilation process every single time you boot the computer. So that's hard-coded, um, I mean, it's usually hard coded onto little uh, little pieces of ROM or like read only uh, memory that's that's like on the board itself, and it just loads. It. So what happens is there's something called like a bootstrap, right? And so you know exactly like you know all the memes of like pull yourself up by your bootstrap. Yeah. So the BIOS. Um, so basically what happens, we'll go over kind of boot procedures in here. Um, that's usually, a boot procedures is something that's very good to know because that is a very, very, very common interview question to get on anything application or anything operating system related or a lot of times computer system related. But basically what you need to know is that there's a little bit of code that's responsible for bootstrapping, which basically means pulling up the rest of the code and so you have this tiny little bit of flash that holds this code so it can get the rest of the code from memory. Dr. Madden, thank you for the follow. Okay, so moving on. The matter of what constitutes an operating system became increasingly important as personal be uh, computers became widespread and operating systems grew increasingly sophisticated. So, you know, operating systems are only getting more and more complicated. You know, it may be easier to use on the top of things. So, you know, you look at something like Windows 10 or you even look at something like Ubuntu. I click icons, it opens programs, everything just kind of works. But back in the day, this wasn't the case. A lot of times we had to, if we wanted to do anything like original Windows or original, a lot of original Unix operating systems, we just had a terminal. Okay. So in 1998, the US Department of Justice filed a suit against Microsoft. So Microsoft got sued, claiming that Microsoft included too much functionality in its operating system and thus prevented application vendors from competing. So this looks like some kind of monopoly lawsuit. As a result, Microsoft was found guilty of using its operating system, Monopoly, to limit competition. So we don't hear a lot about this nowadays. This is pretty interesting. We have, you know, somebody made it, somebody made their thing too good. They made it so good that nobody else could compete. So all of a sudden you got the, you got the Teddy Roosevelt trust busting type things come, going on, where all of a sudden Microsoft is getting served by the Department of Justice. <laughs> Today, however, we look at operating systems for mobile devices. We see that once again, the number of features constituting the operating system is increasing. So mobile operating systems often include not only core kernel, but also middleware. And we're talking about middleware. We're talking about a 
a set of software frameworks that provide additional services to application developers. For example, each of the two most prominent mobile network operating systems, so iOS and Android, features Core Kernel, along with support for databases, multimedia, and graphics, to name a few. Very interesting. So now that we've gone over kind of the different kinds of operating systems and some loose definitions of what we can call an operating system, now we can start looking at, okay, how are computer systems organized? So let's start here at computer system operation. So here is what, here's what we were talking about earlier, kind of the boot procedure. So a modern general purpose computer consists of one or more CPUs and a number of device controllers connected through a common bus. So this is that von Neumann architecture. Each device controller is in charge of a specific type of device, for example, disk drives, audio devices, or video displays. The CPU and the device controllers can execute in parallel, competing for memory cycles. To ensure orderly access to shared memory, we have to have a memory controller. So the memory controller basically takes all these requests, they buffer them, and then they try to serve them fairly. For a computer to start running, for instance, when it's powered up or rebooted, it needs to have an initial program to run. And so this initial program is what we call a bootstrap program. And it tends to be very simple. It's generally very simple because you know, we generally want to keep this on a very small piece of read-only memory or ROM. Or sometimes, I guess, EEPROM, which is electronically erasable uh, programmable or yeah, electronically erasable programmable read-only memory. So just two different kinds. One of them is programmable, the other is not. Known by the general term as firmware. So we, this is what we mean when we're talking about firmware sometimes. It initializes all aspects of the system from CPU registers to device controllers to memory contents. The bootstrap program must know how to load the operating system and how to start executing the system. So typically in an operating system, and since I'm not an operating system researcher, I'm not sure of the specifics of this, but, we mentioned, but I remember hearing it mentioned by the professor in my operating systems course is that typically there are dedicated what we call special places in memory so that this bootstrap program or this firmware when it's trying to initialize everything it can look at this certain place in memory and it knows okay I know this part of the operating system will be here and so it can go grab it and so typically there there's there's what is known as these special places in memory. Okay, so here we have you know a basic diagram. Basically, memory is connected to everything: our CPU, our disk, our USB controller, and our graphics adapter. You know, it all goes along this big shared bus. And then we have all of our I/O right here, and so these are typically called things like memory mapped I/O and lots of things are generally mapped to memory. So here we have the interrupt timeline for a single process doing output. So we have an active low signal here. So, and I guess these are, okay, these are just little time frames it's doing something, okay. To accomplish this goal, the bootstrap program must locate the operating system kernel and load it into memory. Okay, so we're looking for the kernel. That's that special place in memory that we're looking for. So once the kernel is loaded and executing, it can start providing services. So once it's actually in memory, the kernel can kind of take over and say, okay, I know where I am now. I can start doing my work. So some services are provided outside of the kernel by system programs that are loaded into memory at boot time to become system processes, otherwise known as system daemons, that run the entire time the kernel is running. So in Unix, the first system process is init. And so if you ever, so there's something, if you have a process that maybe fails or you're, you're not very good at 
splitting processes using fork and you may have heard of something called zombie processes and so these are processes that you know their their parent ends but they don't end and so sometimes they can just be left running indefinitely um, generally these will get collected eventually and they will all be under this init system process since this is basically the the father process for all processes so and it starts many other daemons once this phase is complete the system is fully booted and the system waits for some event to occur so this is going to be some input the occurrence of an event is usually signaled by an interrupt either from the hardware or the software so we can have hardware or software interrupts hardware may trigger an interrupt at any time by sending a signal to the CPU usually by way of the system bus. Software may trigger an interrupt by executing a special operation called a system call. So we generally call these syscalls. Uh, I guess sometimes they call them monitor calls. I've never heard them called monitor calls though. When the CPU is interrupted, it stops what it is doing and immediately transfers execution to a fixed location. So basically what happens on interrupts, you know, Based upon the interrupt, it says, okay, if this interrupt happens, I have to go here to this kind of, this fixed routine, and this is what I'm gonna service at this point. So the fixed location usually contains the starting address where the service routine for the interrupt is located. The interrupt service routine executes, so the ISR executes, and when it completes, the CPU resumes the interrupted computation. So basically, if there's a return, there's some kind of jump to the original uh, position. So the address where we stopped, where we got interrupted, that gets saved when we jump to this, uh, uh, this interrupt service routine. So interrupts are an important part of a computer architecture. Very important. Each computer design has its own interrupt mechanism, but several functions are common. So what's common to all of these? So this idea of transferring control to the appropriate, appropriate, appropriate interrupt service routine. So every single interrupt handler will have a way of this transfer of control. So one method for doing this would be to use some generic routine and then to examine the information. And then we call a specific handler depending on what that is. So this basically says that Whenever there's an interrupt, we go to some generic handler. Then from that handler, we look at the information about the interrupt, and then we call the specific handler that says, oh, this is interrupt type A. This is interrupt type B. So since only a predefined number of interrupts are possible, a table of pointers to interrupt routines can be used instead to provide the necessary speed. So basically, we fix the number of interrupts that we can possibly have. We know that there can't be any more than these. And so when an interrupt happens, it goes to this very specific location. And so it's held by some pointer. So generally, the table of pointers is stored in low memory, the first 100 or so locations. So this is this idea of having special places in memory. So we have special places in memory that have a fixed meaning. So these locations hold the addresses to interrupt. Okay, and we call the, you know this collection of these pointers or this array the interrupt vector. Okay. So this is something that we've seen in I think every other course we've gone over. And this is basically just how information is stored using bits and bytes and words and then typical things that we look at size wise such as megabyte kilobyte does low memory behave differently from high memory or is it just a place nope it's just a place in memory it's just a fixed place in memory so the interrupt vector um, will not be used in memory that's something that's kind of that's that would be out of bounds right so typically the way it looks is there's like a little bit of padding um, so you have your low memory or I think you even have a little buffer at the very bottom of low memory. 
so of the address range. So you have a little bit of a pad at the bottom, you have your interrupt vector, and then just above your interrupt vector you have another little pad, and then you have, you know, say, you know, your regular memory that you can access. Now, it, what happens is if there's, if you try to access something that's below some certain range in, say, regular memory, not this low memory region with the interrupt vector, you're probably going to get an error, and that's protected because it has a little buffer there. It has a little region that doesn't do anything, a little region of memory that's basically wasted, but it's wasted for a purpose. And we'll, prob we'll go into this when we go into uh, the memory part of operating systems. So the interrupt architecture must also save the address of the interrupted instruction. So that's what I said earlier. Once we have an interrupt, we need to make sure that we have the address to go back to where we came from. More recent architectures store the return address on the system stack. Okay. If the interrupt routine needs to modify the processor state, so for instance by modifying register values, it must explicitly save the current state. So this is something that we generally call like checkpointing. And then restore that state before returning. So oftentimes when, we're talk when we have to talk about saving and restoring state, another word for that is generally precise exceptions. And, or something like precise state. So we know precisely what the state looked like before we did something. And so that's our checkpoint to go back to. Okay, let's talk about storage structure. So we load instructions from memory, and so any programs can be stored there. So general purpose computers run most of their programs from uh, random access memory. Typically the technology is DRAM. We're not gonna have some giant SRAM thing. SRAM is very expensive and not nearly as dense as DRAM but DRAM is a little bit slower. So computers use other forms of memory as well. So we talked about ROM or EEPROM for things like the bootstrap program. Um, but we can actually change the bootstrap program in an EEPROM. So that's the main difference between ROM and EEPROM. Okay. So all forms of memory provide an array of bytes, each byte has its own address, and then interaction is generally done by instructions that are loads and stores. So sometimes this is called you know, a load store architecture. So a typical instruction, execution, so a typical instruction, execution cycle as executed by a system with a von Neumann architecture, which is every modern CPU architecture nowadays, first fetches an instruction from memory so generally there's two kinds of memory that we kind of classify them as or split a little bit. It's instruction memory and data memory. And so then we store this, that instruction in an instruction register. So then we do what's known in the pipeline as decode, where we figure out what that instruction represents. And so what this may cause is for you know, some operands to be fetched from memory and stored in some internal register. Then after the instruction on the operands has been executed, so then after we have decode, we generally have execute, the result may be stored back in memory. So this is generally called write back. So we write it back to memory. So notice that the memory unit sees only a stream of memory addresses. It does not know how they are generated by the instruction counter, indexing, indirection, literal addresses, or some other means. So basically we kind of, we take the memory system and we say, you just stay over here, we'll give you the correct looking information, you just do your job and get us the values. So accordingly, we can just ignore how a memory address is generated by the program. We are interested only in the sequence of memory addresses generated by the running program. Ideally, we want the programs and data to reside in main memory permanently. But however, this is are usually not possible for the following two reasons. So one, main memory is too small for permanent storage. And then also, 
main memory is volatile storage. So DRAM, when you lose power, you lose everything. So typically, if you have a program, you don't want it to be permanently stored in something that if you lose power, it goes away. So that's generally why we have secondary storage, which is an extension. And this is usually things like, you know, our hard disk drives. So here's an actually, here's a very interesting thing that I learned in my operating systems class. So there's something called RDMA, which stands for Remote Direct Memory um, Access. So here, let me, let me, let me write that out. Uh, where's my... Oh, there it is. I need black. So we have something called RDMA. And so this is remote direct memory access. And basically, under RDMA, you may have, say, some box in the middle that has a shared, uh, shared cache or shared memory in it. And basically what they found is that if you have, say, a PC over here and you have a PC over here, and you had them connect, or they connected over RDMA to this shared memory, it's actually faster for the PCs to access this shared memory than it is to go to their own internal hard disk drive. So it's actually fast for, faster for them to go to another machine, look it up in the RAM, and then, so if we draw the kind of path, it's faster for them to go this way get the data out, send it back across here than it is to go to your own disk drive. This is actually faster, and I found that to be pretty amazing. And not just faster, it's orders of magnitude faster. Disk drives are so incredibly slow. How is that faster seems counterintuitive unless I'm missing something. So the problem is that when you're going to your own hard disk drive, you have to go through your entire memory hierarchy. Yeah, so a seek time is super lengthy on disk. Is this, is this applicable for things like uh, M2 and PCI attached storage? So yeah, you're talking about like the PCIe SSDs. So I'm pretty sure RDMA is still faster than that. Because, you know, no matter what, doing something in memory is always going to be faster than having to fetch it from disk. Because if you're fetching it from disk, you're still having to go over the PCIe bus. So it's a lot, so over the PCIe bus is of course a lot faster than going over um, SATA to your spinning disk drive that has to seek the location. That's of course going to be a lot faster, however, you know, if, if we think about the connection speeds that we can get with fiber optic connections, right? Fiber optic connections are going at the speed of light. Speed of light is pretty darn quick. Yeah, this is some really interesting stuff. I'll have to get more information on this so we can look over this. But yeah, I found this to be really, really interesting. And so that's one thing we'll learn in this uh, when we go through this book. We'll get an idea of how we can classify, you know, if we talk about how long does it take to get data from an L1 cache if we hit, or how about from the L2 cache if we hit? Okay, how about from main memory if we didn't hit in our caches? Okay, and if we didn't hit in anything, what's the order of magnitude of clock cycles to go fetch it from disk? So we'll get a rough idea of that. And then you know, regular PC numbers that we typically look at when we're looking at spec sheets, they'll start to make a little more sense and we can compare them a little more fairly now. The key idea when we're, when we're always talking about memory is we want to hit in the cache. We want to hit in the cache above all else. And then if not the cache, at, at worst we want to be hitting in memory. Okay, so most programs, system and application, are stored on disk until they're loaded into memory. And then many programs then use the disk as both the source and destination of their processing. 
So the proper management of disk storage is central importance to the computer system. So we'll go over that in chapter 10. In a large sense, however, the storage structure that we have described consists of registers, main memory, and magnetic disks. It's only one of many possible storage systems. So we can include caches in this hierarchy, we can include, you know, additional things like CD-ROM or magnetic tapes, which are so incredibly slow. <laughs> Each storage system provides the basic functions of storing a datum and holding that datum until it is retrieved at a later time. The main difference among the varied storage systems lie in the speed, cost, size, and volatility. And so that's where we generally get this idea of the memory hierarchy. So the memory hierarchy it's generally, when we talk about it, oops, that's a bad line. It's generally this triangle where down here at the bottom we have things like disk, then we may have things like main memory, then we have our caches, say L1, L2, this will be DRAM, and then here at the bottom is disk. Okay, and here we, oh, okay, so they even do it here. So basically, here our primary concern is latency. Now, once we get to, you know, more, kind of, kind of when we get to the bottom of the caches, the last level cache, we're still, con we start to be concerned with capacity. Um, and so generally your L1 and your L2 cache will probably be something like SRAM, which is very quick. However, your L3 cache, because you're concerned about capacity, will generally be something like DRAM. Then main memory will be DRAM. You have your solid state disk where, you know, then you're moving into different technologies. Uh, then you have magnetic disk or hard disk drives. Optical disk, even slower. Magnetic tape drives, of course, the slowest thing that is still used in some places today. So you know, large companies that have incredibly large amounts of data, you know, they, they might have these cold storage magnetic tape backups. Like Exxon has a ton of these. They have warehouses full of giant spools of magnetic tapes with uh, seismographic data on them. Illuminati confirmed. Yeah, it's the, it's the Illuminati storage device hierarchy. Magnetic tape is the best storage for capacity. It is just slow as hell. Yep, that's true. Um, oh, there's also, there's there's so there's another there's another big problem with uh, with magnetic tape drives, and this goes back to the protocol of magnetic tape drives. So let's say we're looking at magnetic tape drives, right? And we have a bunch of reads, okay? So sometimes while we're doing reads, something happens and one of these reads gets messed up. Now, the bad part of magnetic tape drives is that so we go here, we do a read, we go here, we miss on a read and we try to do another read. What ends up happening here is you have to completely rewind it can't handle, I think, even a single missed read or a single missed write. You have to completely rewind the tape. So that's another. That's a reason why uh, it's so bad. For magnetic tapes are so bad. However, with something that's much quicker. So if we're talking about something like, uh, if we're talking about something like even SATA, SATA is a lot quicker. So say we have the same scenario, this, and we're going along, we're chugging along, and we miss here. Well, what they can do is they can just immediately send another request, still within this time frame, and then they can get this read. So it's fast enough to do this, you know, this quick patch up. SCSI or BUST? Listen, unless you're talking about Serial Attached SCSI, otherwise known as SAS, I don't want to hear it. 
listen, I know all about SCSI. I was a, I uh, I was a raid storage engineer. So I I worked a lot with SAS drives. I took an entire course on SAS 3.0 protocol. Okay. So let's continue on. So semiconductor memory has become faster and cheaper. We know that because of Moore's law as well. So as mentioned earlier, volatile storage loses its contents when the power is removed. There's actually a fun fact about this. It doesn't lose its storage, not immediately. I'm sure you'll continue to use that knowledge as a storage historian. What, SAS 3.0? SAS 3.0 just came out. SAS 3.0 is brand new. It's like 2017. <laughs> oh, SCSI. I mean, technically SAS is built on SCSI, so a lot of SCSI protocol things are still in SAS. Okay, we're moving on though. So, uh, yeah, volatile storage loses contents when power is removed. And so we need to make sure that we write things to non-volatile storage for safekeeping so we don't lose our information. Then, of course, we have solid state disks. So solid state disk stores data in a large DRAM array during normal operation. But there's also a hidden magnetic hard disk and a battery for backup power. Okay. So then, when external power is restored, the controller copies the data back to RAM. Another form of solid state disk is flash memory, which is a popular in cameras such as PDAs and robots and for storage for general purpose computers, so like flash drives. Flash drives use, of course, flash memory. That's where the flash comes from. Um, but it doesn't need any power, power to retain its contents. And then another form of non-volatile non storage is NVRAM, um, in which DRAM with a battery power backup. This memory can be as fast as DRAM and is non-volatile. And then the most recent type thing in this kind of field is, or at least on the consumer market, is NVMe, which is non-volatile mem memory. And it's pretty similar to this idea of NVRAM. But I think the idea behind it is that it's 3D stack. So like Intel Crosspoint that was developed by Micron. That's an example of NVMe. So let's see. So typically when we're talking about the memory system, we need to just keep in mind it's a balancing act. I just looked up SAS4, almost 24 uh, gigabit. Yep, listen. Yeah, it's um, SAS4 is weird. SAS4, they did a lot of weird things. Um, they switched their encoding protocol as well. It, they used to have 8B, 10B for some reason, which was confusing to why they did that. And then, so PCIe uses 128, 130 encoding, but for some reason, SAS4 decided to go with 128, 150 encoding. Don't ask me why, I, it's, nobody knows. But let's move on to the IO structure. So, a general purpose, so we have multiple device controllers in here. We have things like SCSI system interface controllers. Uh, typically, operating systems have a device driver for each controller. So, this is a way to con control these controllers is through a device driver. And so, that's what basically what a driver does. This device driver understands the device controller and provides the rest of an operating system with a uniform interface to this system. To start an I.O. operation, the device driver loads the appropriate registers within the device controller. So then the controller examines the registers and then it sees what, access to, what action to take. So then the controller starts the transfer of data to its local buffer. Once the transfer of data is complete, the device controller informs the driver via an interrupt that it is finished its operation. So then this is returned to the, operate, the operating system. 
and then it could be returning a data or a pointer to data if the operation was a read. So basically this is saying that you know we have these we have these systems in place where we have some controller that's doing some setup on the device side, the device is say crunching on some data, it does a return, the driver interprets that as an interrupt, the interrupt goes to the operating system and says, hey, here's the data, or hey, here's the pointer to the data. Okay. So this form of interrupt-driven I.O. is fine for moving small amounts of data, but it can produce high overhead. So if we have, you know, tons of interrupts, we're going to have, you know, we're going to have to handle all these interrupts. So what else can we do? We can have thing called DMA or direct memory access. So after setting, uh, after setting up buffers, pointers, and counters for the I.O. device, the device controller transfers an entire block of data directly to or from its own buffer storage to memory. So that's what I was talking about when I said that we have remote uh, uh, direct memory access. So it's basically the same thing, except this time, instead of being on the same machine where we're directly connected, we're remotely connected. We're another PC that's sending a request over some uh, RDMA line. Only one interrupt is generated per block to tell the device driver that the operation has completed rather than one interrupt per byte generated. So if we're transmitting a lot of data, this is not or this is much better because we're not generating one interrupt per byte. Okay. So now we can get into some computer architecture, so more of my interests. So here we have uh, a modern computer system, a very abstracted away modern computer system. So of course we have our CPU with n amount of cores, and then within these cores we have different threads of execution. Of course between the memory and the core we have caches to try to hold uh, reusable contents of memory you know, that can be accessed very quickly. Um, as long as the working set fits in the cache. Let's see. And then we're of course going to be have we're going to have to, you know, every once in a while, we're going to have to be moving data to and from memory and the cache because we might miss in the cache. Love, thanks for the 30 bits, man. I'm glad that you're here. Okay. And so memory can have both instructions and data. And generally this cache can also have instructions and data. So we can have an I cache and a D cache. So an I cache is of course an instruction cache and a D cache is of course the data cache. So then we have other devices. So we have, you know, I have things for IO requests, things for data transfers directly to the CPU, and also ways of handling interrupts. And then of course, other devices can have DMA or direct memory access so that we don't have to go through the CPU, generate an interrupt, go to memory, and then come back. How come CPU, is there any benefit to having a larger CPU cache? If so, why isn't that a thing? Okay, so what happens if you gradually make a CPU cache bigger? It just becomes main, main memory, right? The idea behind having the idea of having a cache at all is that it's faster the idea is okay if I have a small cache up here that's very fast that means I have something that quickly services the small amounts of data that I'm able to capture with uh, temporal and spatial locality. Then I have the L2 cache over here. So this will be the L2 that says, you know, we're pretty fast, but we want to make sure that we're capturing even more. Once we get to something like DRAM, we're only concerned about capacity. We want to make sure that nothing goes to disk. 
and we do a really, really good job at that. But if we basically make the CPU cache bigger, that means that we're basically making it slower. So we're losing this advantage of having these small, fast memory structures at the top of this pyramid. We basically turn the pyramid into just a block. So we basically make it so that no one has an advantage. It's all uniform. And typically, we're, we want things that are latency sensitive. We, we, you know, uh, CPUs are latency optimized processors. And so this idea of having, you know, this, these larger caches that are more like memory, this goes e completely against that idea. Okay, so let's move on. And we also like spending fewer than 10K plus on CPUs. Well, I mean, so, so cow turd. Um, that's an interesting question. So if we're going to make the caches bigger, we're probably not going to make them out of SRAM. They're just going to be out of DRAM, right? Because we could, we could not afford to make them out of SRAM if we were to make giant structures out of SRAM. It would be far too costly. So in that case, we would have to make them out of DRAM. But then we run into all other problems uh, um, as well just with power. Okay. So single processor system, so the, the single core CPU. So until recently, most computer systems weren't used on a single processor. This is a little old now. True, but it all goes back to the expectation of users. Most people wouldn't need a, a very big cache anyway, right? Yeah, of course. So we wouldn't, we of course don't need a very big cache. So the caches to only help us when we actually have locality. If we're, if we're doing something like uh, streaming data, generally the prefetcher can help us out there um, anyway. So we're not, we're not relying on you know, the caches themselves anyway at that point. What about supercomputers? What about supercomputers? Anything in particular about supercomputers? I mean, supercomputers are also latency-sensitive uh, things. They're, they're slightly more throughput optimized, but CPUs themselves are highly uh, latency optimized. And unless we're talking about like a national lab supercomputer that has 10,000 Volta GPUs, <laughs> which I think Oak Ridge has a supercomputer with 10,000 Volta GPUs or I I don't think I'm, I'm I don't think I'm overestimating that. I think they released something that said they had 10,000. Okay. So let let's continue on. So we'll just go ahead and skip over the single cycle processors because this is so far away from what modern CPUs are now that there's no point even considering it anymore. We can just kind of ignore this. Uh, one of the things that, you know, I like to, I want to kind of bring my opinion in on is um, with every generation and with every new technology, um, these books keep getting written and they keep getting bigger and bigger. And it keeps going, okay, well, now we have to learn about single cycle processors and then we have to learn about multi-processor uh, multi systems. It's of my opinion that this is not a sustainable form of education because it's going to get to the point with the amount of prerequisite knowledge that you have to learn is going to take up all of your time and that it will be so hard to get to what is modern because you're so focused on what was done in the past. So I think a lot of times we can understand that there used to be single processor systems. They were more simple. They had a single core. Okay, so what does it look like when we have multiple cores? Welcome to math. Feels good, man. Listen, that's one of the things that I'm jealous of with math is these like layers of abstraction. In engineering, so often, they don't do these layers of abstraction. Old professors think that you need to teach every single thing that they learned. <laughs> it makes me sad. 
but okay. But it's okay because I have control over that here. And I'm not going to be one of those old crusty professors that makes you learn every single thing. Like, why do they still have you learn how to blink an LED with, like, a microcontroller in an electrical engineering class? What a waste of time. What a waste of time. That is absolutely pointless. Okay, so let's get into this. So within the past several years, multiprocessor systems, also known as parallel systems or multicore systems, have begun to dominate the landscape of computing. Such systems have two or more processors in close communication sharing the computer bus and sometimes the clock, memory, and peripheral devices. So we have massively shared resources now within one system. So they first appeared uh, prominently in servers, but now a lot of desktops and laptops. So this is something we know already. We have i7s and laptops. Well, I mean, you still have a couple thousands of years of math you need to learn. We just have the new tech package. Um, it in all, or we have new tech to package it all in a new, in a more, in a much nicer way. Yeah, yeah, of course. So I mean, my my key point is, so if if you watch any of the stream I'm going to do tomorrow, I'm going to do basically a beginning computer engineering textbook that most universities use, or they use something very similar. The book, half of the book is pointless half of the book could be abstracted away. It's basically you do the things in these book to you know get some understanding and some background and then you will never use it after that. And I mean never, there is not a possibility in your future that you will ever even hear these terms later again. It's like Karnoff maps. You will never use a Karnoff map ever again. I'm not sure for the people that do electromagnetics but I'm also pretty sure that you never have to hand do a Smith chart ever again after an electromagnetics class. Yeah, K maps. K maps are something that they're not that difficult. They can be time consuming if you get like a five variable K map. Listen, I've got nothing against K maps. I've got nothing against them. I mean, I had fun when I did them too because it looks like you're doing something pretty cool. But Okay, so your money, uh, your move creep and grave fifty six. Have you ever used K maps after that logic design course? After that, like yeah, contemporary logic design course or fundamentals of logic design course? Have you ever even touched a K map or thought about a K map? So for people that don't understand what we're talking about, we're talking about ways of solving uh, uh, truth tables. Oh, you just finished the class? So we're talking about ways of solving truth tables to create circuits. And so we have these things called k-maps where we can make combinations of terms in order to reduce a Boolean algebra. And so basically by circling these terms we can get uh, by we can look at these bits over here and we can reduce you know these algebraic equations that are of terms like a a a not c c not yeah this is this is very early uh, computer engineering stuff helpful human ce is starting to sound um, more interesting than ee Listen, man, they're both very interesting. I actually got my degree in electrical engineering. I'm just doing computer engineering as a PhD now. But yeah, you will never see these things again because these are all done by more efficient algorithms than K-maps. This is just a visual way of solving back before computers existed. Okay, that's my little rant on K-maps. So let's talk about the advantages of multi-core, the multi-core era. So we, we get increased throughput because we have now more threads doing things in parallel. So we have economy of scale. So multiprocessor systems can cost less than equivalent multiple single processor systems. So instead of having to have four computers, we have one computer with four cores. And we have increased reliability. So in functions that can be distributed properly among several processors, 
then the failure of one processor will not halt the system. It will only slow it down. So we can reallocate the, uh, the tasks being done to the remaining processors. Okay. So this is something that we generally call graceful degradation, where something happens, but we get worse performance, but you know it doesn't completely kill us. It doesn't completely kill the system. It simply uh, begins to kind of teeter-totter, get worse and worse and worse. And oftentimes we call these fault-tolerant systems where we can actually prevent faults from happening um, with certain, certain hardware or certain software systems in place doing things, or even inside the protocols themselves, having error correcting codes. So the HP nonstop, formerly tandem system, used both hardware and software duplication to ensure continued operation despite faults. So even if there were faults, they had hardware and software to prevent the faults from affecting the system. So there's two times there are two times. There's two types of multiprocessors now. We have asymmetric multiprocessing, and then we have symmetric multiprocessors, otherwise known as SMP. So in asymmetric, a, a, a boss processor controls the system, and the other processors either look, look to the boss for instruction or have predefined tasks. So this is kind of like the, the peripheral master-slave interface. Now the most common ones are more symmetric multiprocessing in which each processor performs all tasks within the operating system. So that means everybody's kind of on the same playing field. They can all do the same thing. And uh, they all share physical memory. So AIX is a commercial version of Unix designed by IBM. An AIX system can be configured to employ dozens of processors. It can run actually in CPUs. That's interesting. So what we'll find as we go through some of these uh, some of these unique kind of systems, we'll notice that IBM is basically the coolest company on the planet when it comes to trying out these neat ideas. Now, none of these ideas ever became something mass adopted, but IBM is number one in coming up with these neat ideas. All right. So let's see. The difference between symmetric and asymmetric multiprocessing may result from either hardware or software. So special hardware can differentiate the multiple processors, or the software can be written to allow only one boss and multiple workers. So let's look at a Sun Microsystems example. So the OS, Sun OS, version 4, it provided asymmetric multiprocessing, whereas Solaris is symmetric on the same hardware. So this is asymmetric or symmetric multiprocessing using the exact same hardware. So this is what we mean by uh, symmetric multiprocessing. So we don't have some leader um, CPU. Everyone kind of does their own thing together. Or they all kind of do the same thing, but they share this memory. Let's see. And here we have a dual core design. And so basically taped out on the same chip, we have these same things we saw earlier. So core one and core zero, they're basically like their own CPU. Hmm, that's weird. Okay. So either way, multiprocessing can cause a system to change its memory access model from uniform memory access, Yuma, to non-uniform memory access, often called NUMA or NUMA architecture. So unified memory access is defined as a situation in which access to RAM from any CPU takes the same amount of time. So with NUMA, some parts of memory take longer to access than other parts, creating performance penalty. So operating systems can minimize this penalty, though, using resource management. And so we don't need to worry a lot about what's going on here between UMA and NUMA architectures. We're going to go over this when we get to chapter 9. So a recent trend is multiple computing cores. So something like the Coffee Lake chips that have, 
What a coffee lake have? Do they have eight cores or something? Is it eight? Or is it 10 or 12 cores? What does coffee lake have? Like the i9s. I don't I, I don't really keep up too much with, you know, the arbitrary number of cores that they add. Basically just throw a power of 2 or a multiple of 2 on a chip and whatever it is. It has a lot of cores. <laughs> okay. So it is important to note that while multi-core systems are multi-processor systems, not all, all multi-processor systems are multi-core. And so we'll see that in just coming up in 133. So like, like we said earlier, if they're taped out together on the same chip, this is going to be multi-core. Multi-processor doesn't necessarily mean that we have they're taped out together. So what are blade servers? So blade servers are a relatively recent development in which multiple processor boards, I.O. boards, and networking boards are placed on the same chassis. The difference is between these and traditional multiprocessor systems is that each blade processor board boots independently and runs its own operating system. So if you look at something like Dell's Vertex platform, Dell's Vertex, so let's actually look up Blade servers. So the Power Edge servers are Blade servers. I actually worked at these when I worked at Dell. So basically, you have. Okay, there we go. So basically, we have these, um, these racks, right, that or let's actually look at Vertex. Vertex is a better example of this. Dell Vertex. Here we go. So where's a bigger picture? So in a Vertex machine, here we go. You have these blades right here. So these are PowerEdge M520s. So these are hot swappable, basically entire computer systems that create one big entire system. So they can either be used together or they can be used independently. And so there are four of these per vertex chassis. So this big thing is called a chassis. And so each, they have four PowerEdge servers in them. So I used, I used to work on this stuff, specifically the vertex line. <laughs> okay. So let's move on. So let's look at clustered systems. So another type of system is a clustered system, which gathers together multiple CPUs. So clustered systems are different from multiprocessor systems, as we talked about in 1.3.2, in as that they are composed of two or more individual systems or nodes joined together. So when we have these hot swappable, basically little sliding trays that have CPUs on them, you know, they all kind of run their OS and do their own thing. However, if we want them to, we can tie them together and basically make some clustered system that is connected at the back end at some back plane, but you know, all their hardware, their CPUs are kind of on their own motherboard. Or not kind of, they are on their own motherboard. So generally when we're doing clustering and we have all of these different isolated separate hardware, we're talking about things where it's high availability, okay? So when we're talking about high availability, that means that we want a lot of redundancy. We want a high level redundancy in the system so that it's not gonna go down if there's a problem on, say, one of those, uh, one of those server racks. So clustering can be uh, structured uh, asymmetrically or symmetrically. So in asymmetric mode, one machine is in hot standby mode. So this means that it can kind of jump in immediately. Hey, no one anime. Nice to see you. Thanks for following. So this is where we have one that's in standby ready to take over if there's a failure. And then we have another way, which is symmetric clustering where they're both running something and they can swap out for each other as needed. 
So generally when we're talking about all these things, we don't have to go into this too deeply. It's important in high performance computing because this provides us with another level of parallelization. Now we have two completely separated isolated resources that have some amount of failover between them so that we can recover if one of them fails. Um, and we can split our tasks between these two things. Okay. So moving on with cluster technology, this can also extend to storage. So we can have things called storage area networks, which we're going to talk about when we get to the storage section of the book, where we can have a giant pool of storage that we connect together. And we basically, it, it looks a lot like a server, but instead of providing some level of compute, it provides us with some massive level of storage shared by multiple computers that may be connected to one another. Okay, so then we have the memory layout for a multi-programming system. So we have the OS is in this, like we said, like this low region of memory. And then we have all these jobs above it. So now let's talk about, we've gone over computer architecture for quite a while. Now we can finally get into, you know, how do we structure an, op an operating system? How does that even look like? If we were to say, you know, today, let's build the Linux kernel. Let's design a new kernel like Linux. How would we do that? So now that we have discussed basic computer system organization, now let's get to the operating system. So one of the most important aspects is the ability to multi-program. A single program can't keep an entire CPU or everything busy at all times. So we need multiple programs running at once in order to use all the resources that we have. So the idea is as follows. The operating system keeps several jobs in memory simultaneously. Generally, they're kept on disk in something known as a job pool, just because we may not have enough size in memory to keep a ton of jobs there. And the pool consists of all processes residing on disk awaiting allocation of main memory. So we have this entire pool. Everyone's nicely waiting their turn so that they can come into memory and eventually be executed. And so like we said, the jobs in memory can be a subset of the jobs kept in the job pool. The operating system picks and begins to execute one of the jobs in memory. So this is basically saying that when we're going to execute something, we pick from that subset that's in the fast storage that's near the processor, not far away at the disk. So eventually the job may have to wait for some task, such as an I.O. operation to complete. In a non-multiprogram system, the CPU would sit idle. So this is basically saying that if we had a uh, non-multiprogrammed, we would just we would do one job. Nothing else would be going on in the system. We would be waiting. If say something like we had an I/O I/O operation on that job, basically the CPU would be completely sitting idle. We'd be waiting for something to come back from an external device. Okay, and then we have um, this idea of switching to other jobs. So this application within Linux is called the Linux Process Scheduler, and it's something that's generally referred to as the Completely Fair Scheduler, or CFS. I'm not sure what Windows does. I would assume that they do something similar. Okay. So, multiprogramming systems provide an environment in which the various system resources, like the CPU and all the other resources, like memory, are utilized effectively. But they do not provide for user interaction with the computer system. So time sharing or multitasking is a logical extension of multiprogramming. So if we have a time sharing system, basically the CPU executes multiple jobs, switching between them at time intervals so that the users can interact with each program while it's running. So this allows multiple things to appear like they're running at the same time when really they're just getting these little time slices. So time sharing requires an interactive computer system which provides direct communication between the user and the system. 
And so typically we need to tune this to the response time. And so if the user clicks on something, so if I click to say highlight something, I typically want it to respond very quickly, if not immediately. So a timeshared uh, operating system allows many users to share the computer simultaneously. And so this same idea of you know, having processes and having calling these things jobs, uh, this is something we'll get into later and with CPU scheduling. And it looks like chapter six, as well as in how we manage memory with this in eight and nine. Basically, this is just talking about this idea of, you know, we have to do this kinds of sharing. We do have a limited number of things we can do at once. So how do we do multiple things and make it appear like they're done at once? And so typically what we do is we cycle through them in some fashion where we give everyone a fair shot at the resources and then we can give feedback to the user in, in, a, in a time providing a certain quality of service, so QoS, that the user is still happy. QoS is, we generally call these things QoS goals. So if we say that when we click on something, we want a response within 500 milliseconds, you know, 500 milliseconds will be our QoS goal. Okay. So in time sharing systems, what do we also have? Um, we do things like swapping, where we're swapping things in and out of main memory to disk. Uh, and this is where we get this idea of virtual memory. Um, versus physical memory where we can actually have pages be brought in on demand from physical memory as needed so it can look like we have a page in physical memory um, but actually that page is still on disk and you know on demand so when we access that page that's when we go fetch it we don't kill up a bunch of time you know say at the very beginning trying to load in all those pages okay so then we can go into what operating systems do so a little bit on operating system operations. So what we talked about earlier were interrupt-driven operating systems. If there are no processes to execute, no IO devices to service, and no users to respond to, the OS is just going to sit there. It's not going to be doing much. So events are almost always signaled by the occurrence of an interrupt or a trap. So generally traps, usually I hear them referred to as exceptions, though. And so the difference is that these are software generated interrupts caused by an error. So like a divide by zero, if we try to access memory outside of an address range that we're given, or even sometimes we can have uh, dedicated instructions to cause an exception. And sometimes this is useful for us. I know ARM has some instructions that are dedicated to throwing an exception. Okay, the interrupt-driven nature for an operating system defines that system's general structure. For example, uh, each type of, or for each type of interrupt, separate segments of code in the operating system determine what actions should be taken. So that's what we kind of talked about earlier when we had this interrupt vector. So we had these set routines in place that had we had pointers to that were hard-coded in memory that whenever we got some kind of interrupt, we would jump to whatever that address stored in memory was in that interrupt vector and we would execute some routine before returning. So since the operating system and the users share the hardware and software resources of the system, we need to make sure that an error in a user program could cause, we need to make sure that you know these things don't cause problems uh, for other programs running. Uh, so we don't want many processes to adversely affect or be adversely affected. So more subtle errors can occur in a multi-programming system where one erroneous program might modify another program. So this is generally when we might have something like an attacker or just somebody that, say, writes kind of bad code. Oh, okay. So we got something from Acute Berry here. Mr. Destructor 500. Thanks for making computer engineering interesting enough. I can stay awake till 2 a.m. listening to it. Listen, ma'am, I'm glad you're learning over here. Listen, I think we're having a great time. 
I'm glad you're here. Thanks for the 500 bits, my friend. Okay. Without protection against these sorts of errors, either the computer must execute only one process at a time so that we ensure that we don't have any of these problems that occur when, you know, say, you know, we have one process completely ruin another process. We need to make sure that doesn't happen. So either we take the super conservative approach and we do one thing at a time. Now, as many of you know, our computers don't do one thing at a time. So this clearly isn't the route we want to go. So we need a properly designed operating system that we trap these kind of incorrect or malicious programs. So this is where we're going to get into dual mode and multi-mode operation. In order to ensure the proper execution of the, operation, of the operating system, we must be able to distinguish between the execution of operating system code and user-defined code. The approach taken by most computer systems is to provide hardware support that allows us to differentiate among various modes of execution. So here we have transitions between user mode and kernel mode. So typically we like this, we like to have these two different layers. So if we have a kernel mode and a user mode, we can keep all of our system type stuff and our kernel code safe within this very trusted area of the kernel while all of these untrusted or potentially untrusted things get these limited privileges in this in this user mode. So at the very least we need two separate modes and that's what we call of course user mode and kernel mode. So we have a mode bit that basically says what something is in. So at boot time the hardware starts in kernel code or in kernel mode the operating system is then loaded and then we start loading the user applications in user mode. So you know we know from the very beginning kind of where we are. We know if things are in user mode or we know things are in kernel mode because we start purely in kernel mode. So whenever a trap or interrupt occurs, the hardware switches from user mode to kernel mode. That is, it changes its state to uh, mode bit to zero. So we go from one to zero. Okay. The system always switches to user mode before passing control to the user program. Okay, so we want to make sure that um, we want to make sure that we don't let a user program get into kernel mode. Uh, we're basically just saying we don't want, you know, user stuff to get into the kernel space. Okay. So the dual mode of operation provides us with the means for protecting the operating system from errant users and errant users from one another. We accomplish this by protection by designating some of the machine instructions that may cause harm as privileged instructions. The hardware allows privileged instructions to be executed only in kernel mode. So if an attempt is made to execute privileged instructions in user mode, the hardware does not execute the instruction, but rather treats it as illegal and traps it in the operating system. So this basically says that we treat these kind of errant or problematic instructions in kernel mode. So if some application does it or tries to do something that it's not allowed to do, it'll fail and cause an interrupt. So that's why we hear illegal and then we trap it. So the instruction to switch to kernel mode is an example as a privileged instruction because we don't want, say, any arbitrary program getting into kernel mode. The concept of modes can be extended beyond two modes, in which case the CPU uses more than one bit to set and test the mode. So CPUs that support virtualization frequently have separate mode to indicate whether the virtual machine manager or VMM and the software to manage this is in control of the system. In this mode, VMM has more privileges than user processes, but fewer than the kernel. So because we're doing some kind of virtualization, we generally want to give this virtual memory manager a little more wiggle room to you know, get a better look at the resources and get closer to kernel mode, but we still want to keep some of that isolation protection there. Okay. So the Intel 64 family of CPUs, so 
basically our i-series CPUs or Xeon series ones support four privilege levels. So it has two bits because two to the two is four. So that means if they have four privilege levels, that means they have to be using two bits. So it, has, so it says it supports virtualization, but it does not have a separate mode for virtualization. So I wonder what those four modes are. We should look that up sometime. Okay, so let's see what other information we have here that would be interesting. So things like system calls. So system calls we can use to uh, for a user program to ask the operating system to perform tasks. So if we can't, say, directly call things that are in the kernel space or these uh, privileged instructions, we can maybe do a system call that will tell the kernel to do this for us. OK, and that's typically what we call a syscall. OK, so the lack of hardware supported dual mode can cause serious shortcomings in an, op in an operating system. So the original MS-DOS written for the 8088, which has no mode bit and therefore no dual mode, so they didn't have kernel mode and user mode, a program running awry can wipe out the entire operating system. So this is pretty scary. Ah, the protection ring, okay. Let's pull this up for a second. This is a picture that I have not seen. So basically we have applications, then we have device drivers, then we have other device drivers before we finally get to the kernel code. So like we've talked about earlier that you know device drivers are things that are for specific pieces of hardware. So we have say our NVIDIA drivers. Now our NVIDIA drivers you know, we want them to interact with the operating system, but we don't want to give them the same flexibility or room as the operating system has. So that's why they're above this privilege level. So these are the four levels. So we have two levels for device drivers, a level for applications, and then a kernel mode. Thanks, Acuteberry. That clears things up. You want more math? Listen, we'll get some more math sometime, but hey, super obnoxious all caps name. You got to look at the schedule, man. On the schedule for today's operating systems. Okay. So Microsoft Windows 7 as well as Unix and Linux take advantage of dual mode feature and provide greater protection for the operating system. So all of these modern operating systems, you know, they they they've solved these problems by now, or they've done a very good job at doing the best they can to solve these problems. Okay. So let's talk about the timer for a second. So of course we want to make we want to make sure that the operating system maintains control over the CPU and we can we can't allow a user program to get stuck in an infinite loop. If a user program gets stuck in an infinite loop, basically what we're saying if uh, the operating system can't get back in control is that if someone wrote a bad piece of code or potentially a malicious piece of code, they could cause a denial of service attack. They could say, I have control over the entire processor because I'm in some loop. So we usually can stop this with you know, something as simple as a timer. And so we have a timer that can be set to interrupt the computer after a specified period of time. And so I think this is what we call the watchdog timer. So if, we, if you ever see, you know, you ever get a blue screen and it tells you some watchdog timer thing, generally this is what it's talking about, I'm pretty sure. So a variable timer is generally implemented by a fixed rate clock and a counter. The operating system sets the counter Every time the clock ticks, the counter is decremented. When the counter reaches zero, the interrupt occurs. For instance, a 10-bit counter with a one millisecond clock allows the interrupt at intervals of one millisecond to 1024 milliseconds in steps of one millisecond. So this basically is just telling us that, okay, in order to prevent, say, one application from seizing control over the entire system, 
we can do something as simple as a counter to give it X amount of time to do whatever it's doing, but no more than that. If it tries to do more than that, we send an interrupt and we, we, we do something about that process. Maybe we kill it, maybe we switch to another process. Okay. So now let's talk about process management. So how do we manage processes? Uh, I don't know if we'll go into something such as uh, the Linux like process schedule in here, but we'll probably get some high-level overview on how this is done. So a program does nothing unless its instructions are executed by a CPU. Of course, an instruction by itself does not do anything. It has to be executed. Okay. Let's see. So a process needs certain resources, including CPU time, memory, files, and I.O. to complete its task. So of course a process needs resources. In addition to the various physical and logical resources that a process obtains when it is created, various initialization data, or input, may be passed along. So if we take something, uh, a process where the function is to display the status of a file on the screen, the process will be given the name of the file as an input and will execute the appropriate instructions and syscalls to obtain and display the desired information on the terminal. Then when the process terminates, the OS has to reclaim these reusable resources. There's actually a pretty funny thing. So this kind of goes into this idea of garbage collection. So garbage collection generally refers to, okay, you uh, in some application, you reserve some resources, and in garbage collection, it's basically going around and figuring out what resources were taken and then what resources you can reclaim. Now, a funny thing that can generally happen is that a lot of people get really, really lazy with their garbage collection, and what they rely on is for someone to go up to the top of the screen and press this X button because as it says down here, when the process terminates, the operating system will reclaim any reusable resources. So as long as your program does not crash before the person presses the X button, you don't need to do any garbage collection. So <laughs> this is kind of a very bad way to program, but it's something that a lot of lazy programmers can uh, sometimes do. Okay, so let's move on. So we emphasize that a program by itself is not a process. A program is a passive entity. It consists of a stored file on disk, whereas a process is an active entity. So remember, when we say a process, we're talking about something that's an active entity. So a, thing, a single threaded process has one program counter, or PC, that will specify the next instruction to execute. And so we'll go over what threads are later. Lev, you do this. Lev, please don't tell me that you do this. I would be very disappointed in you if, if you're that kind of person that doesn't do proper garbage collection. Listen, Lev, I will buy you the handbook for gar of garbage collection if you don't do this. That's, that's you? Okay, I'm sorry, Lev. I'm going to have to buy you the handbook for garbage collection. And I expect you to create your own page-by-page -page series like I'm providing here. And then you, you get to teach us all about garbage collection, Lev. And then you can become a guest lecturer on the Engineering Today podcast. Feels bad, man. No, helpful human. Do you know what feels bad, man? Bad garbage collection. Okay, so let's move on. So the CPU executes one instruction of the process after another until the process is done. Further, at any time, one instruction at most is executed on behalf of the process. So two processes may never be associated with the same program. One program, one process. A multi-threaded process has multiple program counters, each pointing at the next instruction. So let's see what the operating system is responsible for. So the operating system is responsible for the following activities in connection with, the pr with process management. So the operating system has to schedule these things on the threads of the CPU. 
It has to create and delete user and system processes as they complete or finish. It has to suspend and resume processes. If one process takes too long, we have to make sure we suspend it and give someone else a shot. We have to do some synchronization and communication if we have, say, a multi-threaded um, application. That way, two processes can communicate with one another. And so this is generally called IPC, or inter-process communication. So now we can talk a little bit about memory management. So as we talked about in 1.2.2, memory management is crucial. OK. So for a program to be executed, it must be mapped to absolute addresses and loaded into memory. So we need to load some program in memory before we can execute it. As a program executes, it's access program, it accesses program instructions and data from memory by generating these absolute addresses. Eventually, the program terminates, its memory space is declared available, and the next program can be loaded and executed. Okay. Excuse me. To improve both utilization of the CPU and the speed of the computer's response to its users' general purpose computers, oh, sorry, to its users, general purpose computers must keep several programs in memory, creating a need for memory management. So if we keep one thing in memory, it's going to be very, very hard for us to have an efficient system because that means we have to go to disk every time we need a new program. So we want to keep many things in memory. But if we put many things in memory, we're losing, we're going to get a high occupancy in our memory. So it's going to be hard to move things around. So what does the operating system have to do with memory? We have to keep track of which parts of memory are being used and by who is using them. We, we have to make sure that we don't give, you know, applic or program A's memory to say program B before it's finished. So we, the operating system also has to decide on which processes or parts of processes and data to move in and out of memory. We don't want to move stuff out of memory that we need to use still or we need to use recently or next. So then the operating system of course has to allocate and deallocate memory space as needed. And so we'll go over all this stuff in more detail in chapter 8 and 9, but these are just kind of some of the high-level ideas that the operating system has to do. So then, of course, we have memory management, so it makes sense that we'd ha we would have to have something like storage management. So to make the computer system convenient for users, the OS provides a uniform, logical view of information storage. So this is very important. The OS abstracts the physical properties to define logical storage unit, the file. The operating system maps files onto physical media and accesses these files via storage devices. So let's talk about file system management. And this book might go into specific uh, file system things like NTFS. I'm not sure if it does though. Okay, so in regards to files, let's talk about a file is a collection of related information defined by its creator. So it's, let's see, it's related information defined by its creator. And commonly, these represent programs. And so these are managed on mass storage media, so this can mean tapes and disks. And so what does the operating system actually have to do? What is it responsible for? Well, quite a few things actually. It has to be able to create and delete files as needed. It has to create and delete directories that we organize these files in. We have to be able to manipulate said files. We have to be able to map it onto different storage so we have to be able to move these files around. And then we have to be able to back up files on stable, non-volatile storage. So we can't just keep a file in memory because then if we lose power, we lose the file. We have to have some way to store it to non-volatile storage. 
Very good. And so some other things that go along with mass a mass storage environment. Um, so the typical problems we have in a massive storage environment is that we want this very, very high utilization. So generally we care about free space management. We want to make sure we don't create hot spots where you know, maybe this side of the server room has all the data and this side has none. We want to kind of spread it out evenly. So same thing with allocation and we want to make sure we're, the scheduling we're doing is fair to everyone. We don't want to cluster you know, a couple hot spots for very high you know, disk usage. We want to spread that out as much as we can. So everybody's doing something. We don't have just idle servers wasting power doing nothing. So then we talk about some of the later things in the storage hierarchy. So uh, tertiary storage devices. So things like tape drives, um, write once, read many time, or worm and read write formats. So these aren't crucial to system performance, but it still must be managed. These are typically for you know massive amounts of data that we want to store. Okay. So let's continue on. So let's talk about caching. We haven't talked about the caches that much yet. And these are really the first thing in the memory hierarchy after we get out of our private cores. So caching is an important principle in computer systems. So how does caching work? So, okay. Here's how it works. Information normally kept in some storage, so main memory is a good example. As it is used, it is copied into the faster storage system or the cache, which is closer to the CPU core. But it's only on a temporary basis. It, it isn't permanently moved there. So when we need a particular piece of information, what we do first is we check to see if it's in this very fast cache storage. So if it is, we can just access it directly. If not, that's called the cache miss, and they move to the next layer. So if we miss in the L1 cache, we look in the L2 cache. If it's not in the L2 cache, maybe we look in the L3, or maybe we look in DRAM. In addition, internal programmable registers, such as index registers, provide high-speed cache for main memory. So even the registers can act as a cache somewhat. So the programmer, or compiler usually, so usually the optimizations in the compiler are what implements this register allocation and register placement to decide what information is kept in registers and then what we keep in main memory. So oftentimes if we don't have enough uh, register space to store all this information, we generally have something called spilling where registers, data that would normally be in the registers, it spills out into main memory. And then every time we need to access it, we of course need to access main memory. Okay, so other caches are implemented totally in hardware. So for instance, most systems have an instruction cache called an iCache to hold instructions expected to be executed. And so without this cache, the CPU would have to wait several cycles while an instruction is fetched from main memory. Now this seems terrible. If we wanna execute some program, we at least want all of our instructions to be there ahead of time. So for similar reasons, most systems have one or more high-speed data caches in memory. So this is why we typically have an L1, an L2, and L3 cache. So because caches have a limited size though, we need to manage them. We can't just keep a couple things in cache all the time. We need to make sure we're keeping, we're keeping a smart distribution of things in the cache. And so that's typically where we get to things like replacement policies. And so here we can get some uh, a better idea of how slow things are, how fast things are. So when we're talking about registers, registers have a very small space in the total memory hierarchy of less than a kilobyte. However, it's generally implemented with this custom memory or multi-ported CMOS. Gotta go, I'll catch the VOD tomorrow along with all the others this weekend and catch up. Thanks for the lectures. Hey, helpful human, thanks for stopping by. I'm glad you had fun and I'll see you some other time. Okay, so registers, like we said, are very small, but they're very, very fast. So 
0.25 to half a nanosecond is all it takes to access a register. And it has this incredibly high bandwidth of 20k to even 100k megabits per second. And so this of course is managed by the compiler, but it's backed by the cache. So the next thing in the hierarchy is the cache. Then we have the cache, which size is a little bit bigger. We have, you know, a little bit 16, a little bit over an order of magnitude bigger size. It's generally an SRAM now, so it's not quite as fast as this multi-ported CMOS over here, but it's still pretty fast. So in some ways it's about an order of magnitude slower. However, you know, it can be just as fast as the higher end of registers sometimes. The bandwidth is a little bit lower, 5,000 to 10,000 mega, uh, megabytes per second. And this is of course managed by the hardware. So the software doesn't manage the cache. This is something that uh, we implement some replacement policy and the hardware takes care of it for us. And this is of course backed by main memory, the next part. So main memory, you know, typically, you know, a lot bigger. So 64 gig, up to 64 gigabytes usually. Um, it says CMOS SRAM, but this seems like a typo to me. Um, I'm under the impression that most main memory is typically DRAM. So access time is a lot slower, so 80 to 250 nanoseconds. Bandwidth is a lot slower, 1000 to, uh, or, the, or the bandwidth is a lot lower, 1000 to 500 megabytes per second. It's managed by the OS now. So now we're, so we have the compiler doing things ahead of time here at the registers. We have the hardware doing things directly, but now we enter the operating system domain. And it's of course backed by the disk. Now, if you guys were wondering when I was talking about RDMA being faster than accessing disk, this is why. So if we talk even main memory, main memory takes, you know, upper bound 250 nanoseconds, right? Pretty pretty quick still nanosecond time nanosecond scale is still pretty quick if we go to magnetic disk we're talking 5 million nanoseconds 5 million nanoseconds this is really really slow and the bandwidth also is nothing to write home about 20 to 150 megabytes per second very slow Okay, so here we have this kind of migration pattern of this hierarchy. So disk goes to memory, memory goes to the cache, cache goes to the hardware, the register. So typically though, one of the things we need to watch out for is something called cache coherency. So this is because we have multiprocessor systems and we have different caches on different processors that may be working on the same uh, data. Now, if we have temporary variables stored in the cache, those might be different, or they might end up being different on different processors. So we typically need some kind of coherency protocol to make sure that everybody sees the same value at all times, and nobody gets any of these stale values. And we'll see about this later. So this goes way into chapter 17. This is a very advanced concept. So then we have the I.O. system, and we can briefly go through this, but it's very similar to what we've seen before. So of the I.O. system, it, we typically have some memory management so that we can manage the buffering and the caching and the spooling of things from these I.O. devices. We have to have some kind of driver interface to talk to these devices. And then, of course, we need the drivers uh, for the specific hardware devices so that we can talk to them. So we need a general driver interface so that the drivers have some, some way to plug in to our operating system. Of course, security is important to us. So we can briefly go over a little bit on security. So if a computer system has multiple users, we want to make sure that there's some isolation between them. So that's when we're talking about protection is any mechanism for controlling the access of processes or users to resources defined by the computer system. So we're isolating resources here. Protection can improve reliability 
by detecting latent errors at the interfaces between component subsystems. Uh, so a system can have adequate protection but still be prone to failure and allow inappropriate access. So let's consider an example. So consider a user whose authentication information is stolen. Her data could be copied or deleted even though the file and memory protection are working. It's the job of security to defend the system from external and internal attacks. So protection, we're typically talking about something internal, while security, it's something external. Okay. So these are going to be things like uh, user IDs and security IDs or SIDs unique to each user that we, we start to assign privileges to whatever your user ID is. And so that's what these group identifiers for. They identify what group you're in and then what you can do within that group. And then sometimes people need to escalate their privileges. So maybe you've heard about this in some kinds of attacks. So there's a lot of attacks usually that try to start do something and as a regular user exploit some driver bug be able to execute arbitrary code and then do a privilege es uh, a privilege ex uh, escalation where they suddenly become a super user or they get the pseudo rights or admin rights on the machine where they can do whatever they want effectively at that point okay so of course, what are going to be the key kernel data structures that we're going to see throughout this book? So of course, we're going to have some basic things like lists, stacks, and queues. So here we just have an example of a singly linked list. So we can just quickly go over these. So a singly linked list, each item points to its successor. So we have something here, it points to something next, 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 arbitrarily long. In a doubly linked list, it will point to its successor and its predecessor. So these two things would be connected both ways. And then in a circularly linked list, the last element of the list refers to the first element rather than to null. So if we took all these things and arranged it in a circle, we would have a circularly linked list. I think that's also called a circular buffer. So then we have things like stacks. So a stack is a sequentially ordered data structure that uses the last in, first out principle. There are things like queues, which are sequentially ordered data structures that use the first in, first out principle. So here we have a doubly linked list and a circularly linked list where the last item uh, goes all the way back around and links to the first item of the list. We of course have trees which represents data hierarchically. So here we have a fairly simple binary search tree where we have nodes that split into subnodes of two, of max two. We also have hash functions and maps. So a hash function takes data as its input, does some numeric operation on this data, and returns a numeric value. And then this is used typically as the index of a table. So you generally do this to kind of spread out data. Okay. So then we also have things like bitmaps. So a bitmap is a string of in binary digits, such as this, that can be represent or used to represent the status of in items. Okay, so these will just be for statuses. Now we can talk briefly near the end of this chapter about the computing environments. So of course we have the traditional computing environment. So as computing has matured, the lines separating many of the traditional computing environments have blurred. Consider the typical office environment. Just a few years ago, the environment consisted of PCs connected to a network with servers providing files and print services. Remote access was awkward and portability was achieved by the use of laptops. Terminals attached to mainframes were prevalent at many companies as well, with even fewer remote access portability options. So what's the current trend? 
we want to make things more interconnected. So increasing WAN bandwidth or wide area network bandwidth. Lots of companies do portals so that they, you can access internal servers uh, once you're away from that private network. Um, there are network computers or thin clients, which are basically uh, terminals that understand web-based computing. And these are replacing traditional workstations. There's also mobile computers can also connect to wireless networks and cellular data networks to use a company's web portal as well. Very interesting stuff. Very interesting. And so, you know, nowadays what you'll typically see with a, uh, uh, you'll, you'll see most like Windows itself, Windows typically has some like firewall settings as well that can sometimes get in the way for this exact reason. Sometimes the little, you know, if you download some something from GitHub that you want to play with and maybe it connects outward to some network, you might run into some problems because, you know, it may think it's um, doing something malicious. And so firewalls typically try to prevent that. Okay. So then we can talk a little bit about mobile computing, which is one of the more interesting topics uh, as of late. It's one of the fastest growing areas. You can just look at the number of iPhone sales and Android sales to kind of do a sanity check and prove this to yourself. So mobile computing refers to computing on handheld smartphones and tablet computers. These devices share the distinguishing fe physical features of being portable and lightweight. So over the last few years, however, features have become so rich that the distinction and functionality between a consumer laptop or a tablet computer may be difficult to discern. So with how good that uh, phones have become nowadays, typically the only difference between them is that, you know, maybe it will be a little faster of a processor, you'll have more memory, and you'll have more memory bandwidth as well. It will be the key features that differentiate between a PC and a phone now. However, a lot of the functionality, it's equal. So this is just saying that we can do many different things on phones now that makes it very similar to computers. So then we have, of course, distributed systems. So these are physically separate, possibly heterogeneous. Heterogeneous means built up of many different things. Computer systems that are networked to provide users with access to the various resources that the system maintains. So you can think of something like Facebook. Facebook has servers. However, all their servers are not the same. They have many different kinds of servers in many different places of, many of varying quality. However, those all work together to provide the same service. A network, and so then we also have a network, in its simplest terms is a communication path. So just like we learned about yesterday, so TCP IP is the most common protocol for the internet. Most operating systems support TCP IP. We also talked a little bit yesterday about the seven layer OSI protocol. So networks are characterized based upon their distances. So we talked about LANs and WANs and MANs or metropolitan area networks or even personal area networks. And this is just convenient for us as we can kind of break down what we're designing. Because if we're dying a personal area network, you know, what we're going to need or what we need to design for is going to be very, very different if, than if we're designing for a wide area network that is supposed to link buildings or even cities or countries together. Okay. Of course, we have the client server computing, where we typically have the compute server system providing an interface to which a client can send a request to the platform, an action, say a read data. In response, the server executes the action and sends the results to the client. A server running a database that responds to client requests for data is an example of such a system. Then, of course, we have the file server system that provides a file system interface where clients can create, update, read, and delete files. 
So here we have this client server infrastructure given an example. We have some server that's connected to many different clients over some network. So we can log in maybe using our smartphones, we can log in maybe using our laptops, or we can log in maybe using our desktops. All the server sees is the request coming from this network. Then we have something more interesting, which is peer-to-peer -peer computing. So in here, let's see. So to participate in peer-to-peer -peer system, a node must first join the network of peers. Once joined, it can begin providing services to and requesting services from other nodes in the network. So here we have lots of nodes working together, doing things together, sending tasks to and from one another. A lot of times this is done with, I think the Human Genome Project did this, where you could rent out, or not rent out, but you could donate some of the processing time on your CPU in order to crunch data. So that's this kind of idea of peer-to-peer -peer systems. So in here, you know, the processing is done everywhere, if not done in one specific location. So it's not, you know, the service is not isolated to one client. So unlike here where the server is doing everything that's being requested, here we're connected to many different things. Every client is connected to every other client. So they're all working in tandem. Of course, we have virtualization where we can run uh, that allows the operating system to run as applications within other operating systems. So you can think of this as something like VirtualBox or VMware, where say within, uh, within something like Ubuntu, I can use VMware and I can emulate an x86 CPU or I can emulate something like uh, Windows, right? I can download the an image and I can run it on a more or less pretend CPU. So with virtualization in contrast, an operating system that is natively compiled for a particular CPU architecture runs within another operating system also native to that CPU. So something like, uh, oh, there's one that I forgot about. Um, so a lot of times there's important utilities that you can use. So if you wanna work on ARM processors, well, you may not have an ARM processor, so how would you test something like that? So generally what you do is you have some kind of simulator where you actually simulate an ARM processor, like an A5 or an A7 processor. So this is what VMware does that we talked about a little bit. So let's see where they reference A and B. Mm, okay. So typically we have something such as the process which interfaces with the kernel, which interfaces with hardware. Now instead here we have multiple different processes that all access these different isolated kernels who then go through some virtual machine. So this is virtual machine one. It gets a slice of the kernel and it gets a slice of the processes. All of these virtual machines are managed by a virtual machine manager that has access to all the hardware. So underneath all of this, all these virtual machines are sharing the same underlying hardware. However, at this kind of software level, they're completely isolated from one another. They can't see each other. A lot of interesting security um, threats and security papers have come from okay, even though we can't see each other at this level of the hierarchy, we'll st we're still sharing the same hardware, so how can we exploit each other's uh, sharing of resources there? Okay. So a little bit on cloud computing. I've been looking at this fairly recently. So there's different things. There's the public cloud, which is a cloud available via the internet to anyone willing to pay for the service. So this is typically something like Amazon AWS, uh, Amazon Web Services, or Amazon Elastic Compute. So it's available to anyone on the internet. All you have to do is you have to you know, sign up and you have to pay them a bit 
uh, for time on the cloud. Then there's of course private clouds and this is run by a company for their own use so this is just something internal. Then of course there's a hybrid cloud that has both public and private cloud components. And the existence of a cloud has led to the creation of three new services. So one of them is software as a service where one or more applications such as word processing or spreadsheets become available via the internet. Then there's platform as a service where a software stack ready for application use via the internet, for example a database server can be sold and then more what Amazon Elastic Compute does which is infrastructure as a service where they basically sell time on servers and storage over the internet or something like I suppose you could argue that uh, Dropbox is an example of infrastructure as a service because it basically provides you remote storage so here we have an idea of cloud computing we have the internet we have the cloud customer interface, so people request from the internet to the all the customer requests going to the cloud customer interface. Now the management commands goes to the management services within the cloud. There's a firewall in between the internet, so this is going to be some user coming in, and then also between that and the cloud computing or the cloud itself. There's a load balancer and what the load balancer does is it makes sure that no one virtual machine gets bogged down with all of the work. It tries to spread it out as evenly as it can. And then things get served back to the users of course. And then finally we have real-time embedded systems. So these will be just simple devices or things like application specific integrated circuits that perform specific tasks maybe even without an operating system. Then we also have some embedded systems that run with a real-time operating system so this is incredibly latency sensitive where sensor brings in data to the computer the computer must analyze the data and possibly adjust controls to modify the sensor inputs. So most common way we can talk about embedded systems or the most common example we can generally give are computers within automobiles. So fuel injection systems, maybe things like the Nest, uh, that uh, IoT uh, device that's like a thermostat, that will be another real-time system. So then we can kind of glance over most of this, but we can give it a quick look into open source operating systems. So this is more or less the market of what's available out to the public. So there's of course open source and there's closed source. So open source means you can view the source. So this will be something like Linux. Then of course you have Windows and Apple, Mac, OS X and iOS, which are closed source, which means you cannot view the source. So if you wanted to know what it did, you would have to reverse engineer it. You have to figure out what they did and from, you know, this, from things like binaries. So lots of work, not a lot of necessary, uh, not a lot of necessarily good things would come out of it either. So the most common open source operating system is something like Linux uh, or GNU Linux. Uh, so this was created by a student in Finland, good old Linus Torvalds. He's the, uh, he's the main architect, more or less. However, there's plenty of distributions now. So there's things like Red Hat, SUS, Fedora, Debian, Slackware, and Ubuntu. I'm actually using Ubuntu right now. Why am I using Ubuntu? Because that's just what I'm using. That's what came on this computer. That's what was on this lab, mach uh, lab machine when I got it. And this is what all the software that we use runs on. That's why I use Ubuntu instead of something like Arch. So then we have some, it gives you some downloads to some other things. And then a brief summary. So the operating system, of course, manages the computer hardware as well as providing an environment for application programs to run. Interesting. We want to best utilize the CPU 
and the modern operating system is key to that challenge. We saw that there's different levels of privileges in operating systems. We saw some of the data structures that operating systems deal with or uh, utilize, things like lists and stacks and queues. We saw that computing takes place across a variety of environments. So it's important that we understand that there are many, many, many different types of operating systems designed for different tasks. And then we, of course, we saw that the free software movement has caused there to be thousands of open source projects for operating systems. So if we're interested in looking at uh, real code, production code for operating systems, we need only go online. So one of the best ones I like to look at is you can go on this site, it's elixir.bootland.com, and you can look at the Linux kernel in a very clean, concise way. So here we can look directly at the kernel code. We can look at something such as the scheduler. So we talked about the process scheduler earlier. And so here we have a real-time scheduler. So this is actually what the Linux um, uh, 4.18 kernel uses as for a real-time scheduler. Then the scheduler that it uses for all other types of uh, programs is generally the FAIR scheduler or CFS. The it says it up at the top too. The com right here it stands for the completely FAIR scheduling. And so this is something interesting. I may link my GitHub to everyone because I actually designed a scheduler for an operating systems class. Oh man, I wish I'd known about this in my OS class. Listen. This was one of the first things that I learned about when I took my OS class last semester. This site makes things so convenient because say I want to figure out, okay, well, let's look at uh, something like, let's look at NQ entity. So if I do control F and I look at for NQ entity, okay, I can click on it. I can see where it's defined as a function here it will take me directly to the line and on the left side it will actually highlight the line it will also tell me exactly where it's used so it says it's used in line 4486 of fair.c so we can go there and it will take ex me exactly to the line number and we'll see that okay it's calling this within put previous entity. Very, very convenient if you're doing something like hacking in the Linux kernel. This is pretty much absolutely required if you're doing that. Otherwise, it's a nightmare to keep track of these things. And you're doing some, you're constantly using uh, C tags or you're constantly having to grep in order to find definitions. In fact, I don't even know how C tags may, may take forever to generate tags for the Linux kernel. I actually don't know how long it takes to generate tags. I work on some fairly big projects, but I, I don't know how those compare to the Linux kernel. Cal, do you use, uh, do you use C tags? Or I don't know what you do. Do you use an IDE or do you use a like Vim? Vim mostly. So do you use C tags with Vim? Have you ever heard of C tags or have you used C tags before? Okay, so you, you did use C tags. A lot of times I see people that they use Vim and they still don't use the C tags extension. And if you're not using the C tags extension, you're making life, if you work on big projects, you're making life a hundred times worse for yourself.
I get I have the opportunity to use it a lot because right now I'm working on a so in my lab uh, I work on GPU microarchitecture so that usually means that I'm using our simulator and our simulator is fairly large and so uh, I get a fair good a fair bit of use out of using something like CTAGS. However, I'm also working with Sandia National Labs and I'm working on the Structural Simulation Toolkit, which is another big supercomputer simulator that they use. Listen, I've been live for two hours and 37 minutes. So I started around 7 EST, Landy, if that's what you're trying to figure out. So I've been up for about two hours and 40 minutes now. I'll stay pretty consistent to my scheduler uh, with to my schedule so I will always start at the time I'm scheduled to start now how long I go depends on the content that we that we cover I promise that we will always get through the content that we're supposed to get through however I won't make any promises about the extra stuff that we will do after the content but hey, what I want to know is, how is everyone doing today? Ah, uh, okay. Okay, so you're in a different time zone. Got it. Okay, Landy. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, definitely. Listen, check out, you check out YouTube. I put all the VODs up on YouTube as well. There's a link to that below. Um, yeah, you know, you know, if you catch any of the other streams that I do, uh, sometimes I, I'll do a, for me, it'll be a late, late night stream. I guess it will be a little later in the day for you if I do a late night stream. So maybe you'll be able to catch some of those, but hey, if you're not able to catch some of it live, if you want to catch some of it just on the VODs, listen, if you have any questions still, I'd still be happy to answer them. Just shoot me a message sometime. Okay, so here, I'm going to pull up a paper that I found pretty interesting. So let me save this. Okay, let me pull up the paper. It was from security. It was Clementine's paper. Okay. Okay. So I found this paper. I was reading this earlier today, and I found this to be fairly interesting. This is from 2014, and we were talking a lot about the cloud. Arch or we're talking a fair bit about cloud architecture today, and so this is entire paper about the confidentiality issues on GPU in a virtualized environment. So one of the things that I like to look at, or what I've been looking at recently, is, okay, well now that we're really pushing cloud computing, what's it going to take for us to allow multiple users to use the same GPUs within a cloud? And so, first of all, our primary concern, whenever we're doing something cloud related, it has to be security first. If we don't guarantee security, nobody's going to want to use our platform, no matter how fast it is. Because most of the time, people aren't just crunching data that, you know, doesn't have any uh, any value to someone. Generally, they want to use something private. So security is always a very high concern. And then after that, generally we care about uh occupancy so we want to make sure that if we're sharing resources we want to share them effectively but what this paper goes over is that gpus while they're pretty good at the occupancy thing and while they're pretty good at really being uh, good throughput coprocessors they are not very good when it comes to security let's see and so this specifically says that if we wanted to use this in the cloud, we have a lot of potential problems. So what they do in this paper is they give an overview of current virtualization techniques 
and talk about the security implement uh, security implications. So there was another paper that was associated with this. Let's see this nine, and then also fourteen. So what is Envy Tools? Oh, this is a block driver. Okay. What was it? Nine and oh, nine and twelve. Oh, this one. So there's an entire other paper that was on CUDA leaks, information leakage, and GPU architectures. Could I link those in chat? Yeah, of course. So here's the first paper that's on virtualization. And then let's go ahead and look up Wars 12. This one is just on archive, so it should it should be free as well. And then we'll call this one leaks. And both of these are some fairly interesting papers. Like this paper says that um, you can completely read out another program's memory because there's not strict isolation. Now this has changed with the most recent NVIDIA architecture, the Volta architecture where you're not allowed to do that same reading out of the complete memory space but you know you do trade-offs here and there there's some other there's some other interesting implications that uh, that brings specifically it it hints at the ability to do some fairly interesting denial of service attacks and so you know that's something that I'm looking into now So what else do they do in this paper? So they reproduce these, these leaking of memory. So then they also find that even when GPU memory is zeroed, it is only as a side effect of some error correcting codes and not for security reasons. And because it's not used for security reasons, then you can still have the potential of recovering some of this data. And so, uh, they propose a method to retrieve memory uh, in order to get around this zeroing of data. So then they use uh, they use some test beds with Zen and KVM to use the GPU in direct device assignment mode, which is a virtualization technique most commonly used in clouds. And so they they basically simulate a real world cloud. Now this isn't, I wouldn't consider this a great simulation because say take Amazon's uh, GPU rentals in the cloud. So first of all, G Amazon only does exclusive access in the cloud. Secondly, we don't know necessarily what Amazon does in between user launches on a GPU. We don't know if they run some kernel to obfuscate any data that may be left over, it's likely that they would. I can't see any reason why they would not. In fact, I was having a discussion in chat earlier today about this exact topic. Then they also talk about some recommendations to prevent further information leakage. Yeah, some very interesting stuff. They even go over some of the basics of GPUs. Very neat, very interesting, very interesting. Listen guys, we went over the dinosaur book today. We went over the great dinosaur book today. Uh, where's my properties? Huh? Huh? I think we had a fun time today. I don't know what you guys thought. I enjoyed. I enjoyed what we did. I had a very nice time. So what, what is everyone else up to? We have about 13 minutes or so left in the stream for today, unless anybody has any topics that they would like to discuss. 
I'd be happy to answer any questions on a wide variety of topics right now. Anything about myself, anything about computer engineering, anything about GPUs, anything about computer architecture, I'd be happy to answer some of those questions now. As a reminder, there's links below to my Twitter and to my YouTube if you want to follow me there. You can get some extra Uh, you can get some extra information there. Hi, Noon Fanboy. What are some of your publications in? So, um, I'm fairly new to the publishing game. I'm a first year PhD student. I'm working on a couple papers right now, but I've submitted to conferences like the International Symposium on Performance Analysis of Systems and Software, I've submitted to places like the International Symposium on Workload Characterization. I've submit, I'm going to be submitting to ASPLOS and also submitting to HPCA, which is a conference on high performance computer architecture. Um, I may be submitting next year to PACT, which is a conference on parallel accelerators. So these are kind of the conferences that I'm targeting right now. Now, right now, I'm in the early stages of coming up with what my thesis is going to be on. So hopefully I can make the submission deadlines for my first, first author paper that would be in, uh, it would be in August and the conference would be around, I think around November or so. So hopefully I'll, I'll get into that conference. I'd really like to get my first uh, paper accepted into a top conference by then. Let's see. What else do we have? What else do we have to talk about? What do you guys do? Listen, I've been talking a lot about myself. What are you guys? So I'm a computer engineer. It's nice to meet you. I have a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering. I enjoy things ranging from control systems all the way through high performance computer architecture. But what do you guys enjoy? For mechanical electrical engineering student, well, uh, what would you recommend? Uh, what would you recommend would complement? Um, I'm not sure what you mean, high noon fanboy. Uh, as far as software engineering, what skills? Um, so it really depends on what you want to do. Um, so if you told me a little bit more about what your end goal is, or if you know what, uh, if you know what kind of work you want to get into, I could suggest say a language or type of thing to get into. Now, intuitively, machine vision. Okay, so things like computer vision, right? So I think. What you want to be looking into is things like uh, OpenCV. And so, you know, getting a good background in something like Python and, uh, you know, understanding how to at least implement basic things like computer vision and machine learning algorithms using the pre built in libraries in uh, Python, things like TensorFlow and OpenCV, I think that would be a very good start. Now, if you really, really care about high performance stuff, I would look at, you know, maybe even getting into CUDA eventually. So first learn C or C++ and then CUDA, because then you could get a better low level understanding of how these things are implemented and how to maybe optimize them. Okay, and Landy, I'm doing mechatronic engineering at uni at the moment trying to pick up computer engineering as a second degree because it really interests me. Hey, that's awesome, man. So Landy, you'll probably be interested in tomorrow's lecture. So tomorrow's lecture will be a, it will be an introductory computer engineering course that most computer engineers take. 
or I think pretty much every computer engineer take, takes, it'll be on logic design. Um, if you've already taken something like that, well, there's still plenty of other content that we'll be going over. So computer architecture, computer networks, compilers, these are all very common things that you'll learn in a computer engineering degree. Um, I also have some plans. I don't have anything set in stone right away, but I would like to show off some GPU programming on the stream. I would also like to show off some C programming on the stream. I think uh, C and C++ and maybe even Python too. I did a little bit of Python with a very, very late night stream yesterday, but that was because I was helping someone debug, debug their program. So yeah, that'd be great. Comedy links, yeah. That was the comedy, that was the comedy links adventure. Oh man, comedy links, what was he doing? What was he doing? Uh, yeah, we had fun last night with that. <laughs> that would be fun sometime. We could have a, we could have an entire, we could have a section of the stream called like the dining table and it's where people get to do nothing but bring their spaghetti to me and I get to rate it and then we get to fix it together. And we'll, we can call it like the dining room table or we can call it a uh, table for two at Olive Garden and it will be just going over people's spaghetti code. <laughs> I think that would be pretty fun. Because listen, it sounds really mean to say calling, you know, other people's code spaghetti code. I will be the first to admit many, many times, including some of the stuff that I wrote today, uh, not on stream, of course, but when I wrote it absolutely has to, I, it was some of the worst spaghetti code I've ever written, but it worked, so I got away. Favorite math topic slash discipline? Uh, okay, that's probably going to be uh, queuing theory. So that gets into more like probability, probability of random processes. Uh, but uh, queuing theory is my favorite topic in math, mainly because if you think about a computer, what is a computer really? A computer is just a bunch of cues. So queuing theory is probably one of the most directly relevant areas of math for a computer engineer. Yeah, so ideally what I would like to do, so this is the, this is the plan guys. So the plan is if, you know, after however many months of doing this, if I make any money from the stream, I want to dedicate that to actually making a streaming PC. Because right now, I'm streaming from my lab computer. So if I want to stream, I'm basically staying at my lab at my university until around 10 p.m. to around midnight or even later. So I'd like the flexibility to do that from home so, <laughs> you know, if over the next couple of months I end up getting any money from streaming, if anybody subscribes, that money's just going to go to but to building a streaming PC. But like I said, nobody should feel obligated to donate. I'm not hurting for money or anything. You know, I'm a I'm a grad student, so I don't have a lot of extra money. But you know, we can make the lab streams work. The lab streams work just fine. It's low pressure. I'm never going to hide any of my content behind like a Patreon. You never have to worry about getting my exclusive engineering picks at my Patreon. <laughs> These five tips will fast forward your degree. Listen, I'll start a Patreon. It'll be nothing but uh, pay now and you'll get access to these top 10 lewd computer architectures. Data flow architecture like you've never seen it before. Completely exposed.
data flow gone wild. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's a. Uh... <laughs> it's it's a it's an interesting. I don't understand. I so I understand Patreon, but I don't know. I can never see myself doing it with something like educational content. I would feel so scummy, right? Like you're basically saying, "Hey, do you want to learn something?" You can't. You can't learn it unless you pay me. And I don't like that. I mean, I don't like the college system for that. Oh, yeah. It's for things people like, though. Listen, now you know what it's like to be a university. Listen, I know. Listen, if I ever start a university... I'm only going to get like outside funding or use some kind of funding source from somewhere. It's never going to have tuition. You can Landy, I can't imagine imagine how I'd afford to go to uni as, uh in America. I'll tell you exactly how, just like I did, loans. <laughs> I, I had loans in undergrad. It's not fun. It's just what you have to do here, unfortunately. Or live with your parents forever and work full time and take forever to graduate. Yeah, that too. I, I, I've known plenty of people that do that as well. You know, sometimes it's, you know, it's hard. You know, school itself can be a full time job. I was lucky in my school had tuition remission if your parents worked there. Yeah, that's a nice thing. I, f I feel lucky for uh, to like 25, 27. Yeah, I mean, there's there's plenty of people that do that now, too, in the U.S., Landy. Um, even if they, they're not in college anymore, just to save money. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think that's, pretty, that's common in pretty much every place, high noon. Uh, I think... I, I, my, my kid, uh, if I, if slash when I have a kid, my kid will be lucky because I'll be in the same situation where I'll most likely be working for a university. Yeah. No, the tuition remission thing is very nice. I was lucky and, uh, let's see. My dad put four kids through college at a private school. That's 500K. Man, that's expensive. Listen, I know exactly what you mean. The first university I went to was a small private university that cost about, I think, $50,000 a year. So that costs about $200,000 total over four years. Yeah. Private universities are just stupidly expensive. I think the most expensive school in the U.S. is Harvey Mudd. I think it is. I live in the... I used to live in Texas. I don't live in Texas anymore. I live in the Midwest. In the United States, that is. Yeah. Oh, you live in Ohio? Nice. That's not that far from where I live. I don't live in Ohio. I live in Indiana. I guess it's relatively not that far. It's still pretty far. They have a Fogo de Chao in Indianapolis. Yeah, no, Fogo de Chao is really good. Um, so I used to, uh, I lived in San Antonio, and there's a Fogo de Chao in San Antonio, and there's also a, another Brazilian steakhouse called Chamagacha in San Antonio that's really good. It's an, and they have, there's a third one that I never went to, but yeah. No, I really liked uh, Fogo de Chao.
Uh, let me see if I can find the best website. I think it's like, is it? Yeah, it's this place. This place is, listen, if you want to be hungry right now, this is the place to look at. Listen, Brazilian steakhouses, man. Brazilian steakhouses are so good. No, yeah, this this place. Yeah, no, listen, you're telling me, man, it's like 10 p.m. and I'm in my lab. It's 10 p.m. and I'm in my lab and I'm looking at Brazilian steakhouses online. Listen, I know the pain. That is some commitment. Remembering that is actually painful. I want that guy with the meat to just live with me. Listen, that'd be great. <laughs> it makes you want to have a Patreon. Uh, yeah, I mean... I'd, I'd never have a Patreon. Listen, I already... I, uh... No, give to you, not make one. Lol. Oh. <laughs> no, yeah. Yeah, I... It, those Brazilian steakhouses are so good, it's just the fact that they cost, like, 50 bucks for entry. If... But, you know, sometimes you get those glorious coupons where it's, like, half off and you get the full churrasco meal for, like, 50 bucks. Or, no, for 25 bucks. That's the dream. Oof. That's so good. Yeah. I I personally love Brazilian steakhouses like that. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm waiting for In-N-Out. Listen, man, don't wait for In-N-Out. You should be waiting for Whataburger. Whataburger is superior to In-N-Out, and I can tell you for a fact, and that's not just because I'm from Texas. In-N-Out's overrated. Don't get don't get your hopes up for In-N-Out. It's overrated. <laughs> Is that a Western? It's Southern. Whataburger is like a Texas place. I don't know where it is outside of Texas, but it started in uh, on the Texas coast in a city called Corpus Christi. Uh, that's where the original Whataburger is, and it's basically the default chain of Texas. I think it's better than In-N-Out. Now, it's fast food, just like In-N-Out is, but I think it's better. Let's 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 look at it. Let's let's look at it. Um, where's OBS? Here's OBS. So, so this is Whataburger. So they have like these like chicken strip sandwiches, they've got regular burgers, they have avocado bacon burgers on Texas toast, burgers with jalapenos, this is a, this is a patty melt, this is like a mushroom Swiss burger, oh, apparently, <laughs> apparently there, there's, a, there's a comparison between the two. My biggest problem is that I always thought that uh, In-N-Out had the worst fries. What is it about the inconsistency in burger places in the U.S.? You have to leave the state to eat something. Yeah, that's that's a shame. McDonald's is really, I would consider McDonald's to be trash. I personally hate McDonald's. I would never eat McDonald's.
Listen, you don't need to tell me about how close McDonald's is. I have a McDonald's literally across the street from my lab. If I stand on top of my desk and look outside the window above my desk, I can see the McDonald's. bathed in the yellow light of the arch yeah but i'm not purified by it i'm i know i want it no it's disgusting i'd rather go home and cook i i actually enjoy cooking listen i made a luther burger do you know what a luther burger is i made a luther burger it's a burger that's on a Krispy Kreme donut. It's a bacon cheeseburger on a Krispy Kreme donut. Listen, if I want a good burger, I can make a good burger. Or soup. Look at this. Or, so this is, uh, who was who is Luther and how quickly did he die of diabetes? Probably pretty quickly. I made uh, jambalaya with homemade sourdough bread the other day. Or I guess that was like over two weeks ago now. I also made loaded baked potato soup. I also made this creamy basil tomato soup you got a bread maker no i have an oven unless you consider unless you call your oven a bread maker in that case i have a bread maker The oven is an everything maker? Listen, I agree. Oh, this was so good though. So this is from a Lebanese place that I go sometimes. I love Lebanese food. 3D prints food. <laughs> You're half Lebanese? Listen, man, I love this Lebanese place. I go here all the time. Like I. I, I used to go here like almost every single day. It was bad. I love this food so much. Your dad's full Lebanese, awesome. Do you eat really good Lebanese food all the time? Eating out in college? Listen, Lev. Lev, I'm not in regular college anymore. I get paid to go to college. It's different. Okay. Okay. Well, I want to thank you guys for coming to the stream. I'm going to shut off the stream for now. I'm not sure if I'll stream later. I need to take a little break, though. I'm, I'm pretty tired. I might go home. But listen, hi, Noon. No, thank you for coming to the stream. I hope you have a nice night, and maybe I'll see you again soon. Punknuts007, thank you for coming to the stream. Hey, give me a follow if, if you're not already following. If not, that's okay too. Landy, I'll see you later. Thanks for stopping by. Catch the VODs if you're not able to catch the stream, or if you don't want to catch the, vo the VODs, that's okay too. Until then, I will be planning out the next stream. We're going to be going over logic design tomorrow. This Saturday, Sunday, though, different stream time, but we're going to be learning German and Japanese. I'm going to try to get somebody that speaks German on, and if I can find someone, someone that's fluent in Japanese as well. But until then, thank you all for joining me. I'm happy that we could do this together. And above all, I hope that you can go out there and you can learn something new. I'm Engineering Today, and have a nice night.